our first company on stage. Is, they're grabbing hold of new opportunities, big opportunities. I think we all are fairly well au fait now with uh, the world's prime uranium district located in Canada, which is of course there, Athabasca Basin. Uh, now, recharge metals have been in Canada since last year, but they weren't there for uranium. However, they have just made an exceptional acquisition in the Athabasca and they're very, very excited about it. And so they're very focused. This is Recharge's MD, Felicity Rapacholi. She has been, you began your career as a geologist. You had two decades and you've added all sorts of other skills. But I know that even though the geology part was many, many years ago, you're very excited about this and you're going to, ex <laughs> you're going to express why to all of us now. Would you please make her very welcome, everyone? on our Newman Lake um, project. So today I'm going to be purely focusing on our Newman Lake project. Uh, this acquisition we acquired just earlier this month and we're pretty excited by it. It's located in the Athabasca Basin in Canada, which probably really needs no introduction after a lot of the presentations yesterday and today. A quick corporate snapshot, um, our ASX code is REC. We have near on 140 million shares on issue a market cap of eight and a half million, and cash in bank at 2.6 million. Both Simon and myself are here today. Uh, we're at booth four, so if you want to, come by and have a chat to us later. Um, and our share structure, you can see from that, is a really tight share structure. Um, our top 20 hold near on 45% of our company, um, and we have a major shareholder in DG Resource Management. DG Resource Management is headed up by Jody DeRouge from Canada, um, and he has been instrumental in us um, entering into the um, Canadian exploration space, and in particular also into the Newman Lake um, project. So he became one of our major shareholders last year when we entered into the Canadian space through the acquisition of our Express Lithium project, which is located in James Bay in Quebec. Um, and earlier this year, we've, well, I suppose over the last year, we've really built on the rapport that we have with DG Resource Management, Jody DeRouge, and also the DeRouge Geological Consulting Team, which does all of our in-country um, geological fieldwork. Um, and this building up of rapport has enabled us to um, really make sure that we're really well aligned with them, um, and it's provided this strong pipeline of projects coming through. Newman Lake being one of those. Um, so that was also vended um, earlier this month through by Jody. Um, he was a 50% vendor. Um, and also um, really key to Recharge is our supportive um, brokers, Pamplona Capital, who are here today. Um, and just I'll give you a little bit of background on Jody because it is key to the story and key to why we are here. Um, Jody DeRouge has had a really long, successful um, history in uranium exploration. He's been working in the Athabasca Basin since the 1990s. He was previous president and COO of Fission Energy um, and played a really key role in the acquisition of several of their key projects, including Waterbury Lake, Patterson Lake and Patterson Lake South. And there's been some really key discoveries come out of those areas, including the J Zone and the Triple R deposit. Uh, so at the Basque Basin, why are we here? Um, as mentioned, I think there's been plenty of presentations yesterday and today. Um, so you're all probably really well versed about the potential of the area. Um, it's home to some of the largest and highest grade uranium deposits. Canada is no stranger to uranium mining. Uh, there's been over 60 years of uranium mining history. At the moment, they produce over 15% of the world's uranium. And why are we here? It's primarily because of the grade. The average grade is 2%, which is 10 to 20 times the uranium grade average in the world. Um, and I suppose really key to note is that back when this project was first explored, the main model that people were working on was the unconformity model, and that was what this project had previously been looked at. There's been um, lots of discoveries and uranium exploration in the area has come along in leaps and bounds since then with now there's a real focus on basement hosted mineralisation and that's predominantly what our um, project we believe is really prospective for and what I'll be focusing on. Okay, so why do we like Newman Lake? So we're located on the northeastern um, edge of the Athabasca Basin. 
It covers approximately 16 square kilometres. We're only 56 kilometres away from ISO Energy's hurricane deposit, super high grade deposit of 34%, with a really high grade core of about 56%. Um, as you can see, this is quite an advanced project. It has been drilled before. But all of this drilling bar two holes were completed in the 1970s and 1980s, as mentioned, purely focused on this unconformity style mineralisation. So what this means is that all the drilling essentially drilled down, intersected the unconformity, and then pretty much stopped. So it barely touched any of the basement style. It pretty much went through the unconformity, 20 metres later, stopped. So regardless of the fact if it was still in uranium mineralisation or if it was still in alteration. It's a really complex geology, which we like. And there's this really large, wide conductive trend zone heading east-west, which is outlined in the red along the um, map there. You can see all the green and brown lines. They're all the EM conductors that have been defined from ground and air work. Um, and important to note that even in this drilling that um, was completed actually by one of Cameco's predecessors, that there was some um, anomalous uranium in those unconformity up to 0.27%, um, which is not to be sniffed at at all. Another really, I suppose, one of the real draw cards that brought us into this is what do we think it could be? And you can see this low resistivity anomaly in there, and that we think has a lot of similarities to Arrow, which you can see on the other side. On there, you've got the yellow wireframe, which is the low resistivity anomaly, with the red in the mineralisation. So our property sits along this strong east-west trending conductive zone within this low zone of low resistivity, which I'll highlight on a cross-section in a moment. And so this conductor, all those drill holes have purely just been focused on the unconformity mineralisation. So here's the cross section and you can see that blue area is, that, is our target zone. That is our area of low resistivity. Um, you can see all of those shallow drill holes lying along the top, um, all along there, and that's the, uranium, that's the unconformity marker there. So essentially all those drill holes pretty much intercepted the unconformity and then terminated. Bar, we have two holes that were drilled into this, one of this on these sections, which is the NL 118003. And these two holes were drilled when the, um, the modelling of the basement style mineralisation had come to the fore, when people started to understand what, what could lie beyond. These two drill holes were drilled by ALX Uranium Corp in 2018, and they were really successful holes. Um, here's some core from both of those. Um, so both holes, the two holes, intersected really strong alteration. Um, they intersected pitch blend, which is a uranium mineral, um, really structurally um, brecciated, really, really encouraging. Um, 2018 pretty much coincided with when uranium was at about $20 a, $20 a pound, and so thereby the project pretty much halted. Um, uranium exploration was no longer going to be the fore for them. Um, so we kind of believe with those two holes, we feel like the exploration for basement hosted mineralisation has only just begun. And just a quick one, I just want to point out the fact of how small the footprints are of these deposits. So on the right hand side there, I'm showing the footprints of all these key deposits. And no, we do not have Cigar Lake and we do not have Arrow and we do not have MacArthur River on our tenement. Disclaimer down the bottom but it's just really to show how these are a bit of a needle in a haystack, bit of game of battleship to try and find. Um, but they are really small footprints, which is something to be really mindful of. So our work going forward. Um, so we'll be on the ground shortly doing a ground gravity survey. This is to really hone us in on some drill targets. And we're working on permitting in the background with hoping to be drilling in the Canadian summer. Um, so in closure, I mean, we are really excited by Newman Lake. We think it represents a um, great opportunity for recharge to make a really exciting uranium discovery. We have significant alteration identified in the basement rocks. We've got this strong, wide conductive trend zone. We've got this coincident low resistivity anomaly. And we've got historical drilling that has demonstrated that uranium is in the system, including by that 0.27% uranium. So what is our approach going to be? Um, our approach is going to be to drill the best targets. So this will be the strongest conductors, the redox boundaries, and through this drilling, we will develop a geochemistry profile that will really allow us to vector in on these key areas. Um, and we have one tremendous advantage, and that is the fact that 
the unconformity in this area only ranges between 100 to 120 metres deep, which is really shallow, so we've got limited overburden to drill through. We have a really strong in-country team with DG Resource Management and the Darouche Geological team, um, so they are invaluable for getting it done. Um, and so just in closure, I mean, is there an ore body like Arrow here? We don't know, but we're intrigued enough that we're going to have a damn good look and find out. Mm -hmm. Right, we're travelling to Brazil next uh, to delve into the rare earth space and we're going to hear from Meteoric Resources who are really confident that they're on track to become the next rare earth project to market in that country. High grades, low cost and the reason I'm told that it is so very, very good is it's almost a spooky reason and this gentleman's going to reveal it all. Who says this? This is Meteoric Resources CEO. Would you please welcome Nicholas Hothouse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chrissy. And I hope uh, I wasn't overcooking the voice using the word spooky, but it, it is certainly interesting. Perhaps maybe that's a better term. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time. Okay, what makes Caldera special? There's, there's quite a few things. Uh, in the ionic clay space, we are quite unique, and it really starts with the resource. We have a quality asset, 409 million tonnes, 2,600 ppm, truly ionic. Now, that is, uh, that is something that uh, a lot of others can't claim. So in the clay space, this is what makes it different. And I'll harp into why ionic is so important a little bit further on. The grades are fantastic, um, and the recoveries that we see are, are exceptionally good as well. The basket that we have, very high content of NDPR, around 31%. That's important. It's a high payer in the basket. 31% of the NDPR equates to around 80% of the value. So it's a really strong driver in the value of our basket. The other 14%, based on our composite samples that we've done test work on, comes from dysprosium turbium, that all important heavy, uh, heavy rare earth metal, magnetic metal. Uh, the ratio in a magnet is around 10 to 1. So if you have uh, a 1 kilo magnet, 900 grams of, uh, of NDPR, 100 grams of DYTB, that makes up the composition of your magnet. Okay, so it's important that we have those compositions. We're certainly looking for more in that space. The recoveries I've already spoken about, We've had some really interesting updates in that space. Uh, when we took on the project, we inherited some work that was undertaken uh, by Jognek. Um, our metallurgical team and ANSTO, who we're using at the moment, were strong believers in the fact that they can improve on those recoveries. They saw some losses in that uh, impurity removal and uh, precipitation down to the carbonate phase, and they've absolutely come true on their word in that space. They've closed that gap and they've increased those recoveries, and we'll talk a little bit more about that further going on. Land holding, we, owe, we own a significant portion of the caldera. It's around 196 square kilometres, equating to around 69 of those tenements. The resource, and just bear in mind, the resource is only based on six of those. So the opportunity to grow this and explore and find more of those very valuable heavies in particular, the DYTB, are immense. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit further on as well. We've got a great leadership team. Uh, we've just bumped it up recently with an announcement. Stuart Gale has come on board as, as CFO. Uh, he's a great uh, addition to the team. We're certainly going to need to rely on Stuart's skills going forward. Uh, he's spent a lot of time in Tier 1 uh, operations in Australia. Uh, he's got experience in America raising funds, so we're really pleased to have Stuart on board and having him help us uh, take this, pro uh, this project forward, uh, particularly in the financing side of things. Uh, and strong development support in Brazil. So we're getting really... As I've, and I've, I've spoken about this many times, we have really a really good and strong support base in the local community. We have great support at the state government level, and we are now building really strong relationships at the federal level as well. So that's super important for our project. It's something that uh, uh, our government uh, relations um, manager, uh, Dr. Marcelo de Cavalas, has done a great job at. He's also one of our board members, but he's really, he's really gone out of his way to build those relationships, and that's all important for taking this project forward and getting it built at best possible speed. And that really bodes into the, uh, into the last point there, the rapid path to development. We really are fully intent on being the next rare earth producer in Brazil. So uh, everything's lining up to, uh, to see us get to that space. All those uh, things that I've just spoken about previously all bode well for us making sure that we are that next producer in Brazil and, uh, and getting an operation up and running. Location-wise, um, we're at the southern end of Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais equates 
directly to General Mines. So it's a mining friendly state. There are multiple licensed operations in uh, Minas Gerais. Some of the bigger names that you see around the place, Bale is one. Uh, so we're in a great jurisdiction. It's very mining, mining friendly and we're certainly seeing that support. As a snapshot, um, we've got about 1.9 uh, billion shares out, on, out in market, which, uh, so we're a typical junior in that space. We've been moving around in, uh, in the project space around 20 years, so we're not unlike uh, a lot of others. Uh, we've got around $477 million of market cap at the moment. Um, and uh, we've got a treasury of around just under, just under $30 million at the moment. So we're well, we're well financed uh, for the immediate and uh, longer term needs of the project going forward, and we're in good space in that sense. The board, uh, there's three doctors of geology you can see there. They've been uh, a great support in getting this project up and running. But more recently, we've had Doc, uh, Mr. Peter Gundy come on board. And Peter Gundy is a really important guy. He's one of the co-founders of uh, Neo Performance Materials. He has a really great depth of understanding of that midstream, downstream processing area, and we're really relying on him to help us connect to that. Connect those dots going further downstream, getting offtakes in place, and, and working out those, uh, those opportunities for us in that vertical integration space in the rare earth industry. And I had to throw that in there, but we've just also been recently admitted to the ASX 300, so that was a welcome surprise. We certainly weren't expecting that. Uh, but being an index fund now, uh, it certainly comes with advantages and uh, we're enjoying those. The differences between hard and soft rock or clay deposits, it really comes down to cost, capital cost and operating cost. And there's uh, a few reasons for that. The ionic clay uh, deposits, the name ionic is important. What it means is those parent minerals have weathered down, they've broken down and they've released those rare earth elements into the wider clay environment. The rare earth elements have a strong positive attraction, the clay particles have a strong negative attraction, and these, they adhere to each other, much like sand on your foot as you come out of the ocean at the beach. It's that same sort of, same sort of stickiness. They're not entrained inside the mineral. There's no robust processing requirements to, to break open those clay minerals to get at those rare earth elements. They're attached to the outside, so that's the difference. In a hard rock space, you need to break open those primary minerals uh, to access uh, the rare earth elements inside and then process those elements to get to a carbonate phase. Mother Nature has done all that work for us up front. That equates to a much simpler flow sheet, it equates to a much lower capex, it equates to a much lower opex. And we certainly see ourselves being at the very bottom end of that operating cost curve, which is important, particularly when you see some of the pricing cycles that are coming, uh, washing through the market at the moment. It's a tough market in the rare earth industry at the moment, uh, but some of the numbers that we're seeing coming through from our scoping study give us a lot of comfort. We're certainly going to be well and truly a going concern, even in these tough, uh, these tough downturns in the, in the pricing regimes that you're seeing coming out. This is a really interesting graph. So this is all about neodymium, praseodymium content, which is, as I said before, a major payer in our baskets, it's a major payer in a lot of baskets. Not all baskets, but a lot of baskets. So it's a good, it's a good yardstick. In that yellow band, you can see where most ionic clay deposits live. They live in that 700 ppm to 1200 ppm sort of range. When I first uh, was shown the data for this project, I was really, uh, I really didn't believe what I was looking at. You can see how much of an outlier this project is. This is based on the, on the inferred resource, on the, on the original JOGMEC drilling, the very shallow drilling, which doesn't go down to depth. Uh, but this thing is absolutely off the charts. And there's a good reason for that. But before we get to that, the bubble on the very right hand side is the 3000 ppm cutoff rate. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a over 100 million tonnes at over 4000 ppm TREO. And this is what we're playing with in our studies going forward and this is what we're going to be running our mind off for the first, likely, for the first couple of decades. So that is one of the, one, it's one of the major levers that this project has. It's, got a, it's a very high grade deposit to start with but it's got an ultra high grade core that we can play with as well gives us tremendous uh, opportunities in that operating cost regime. And this is why it's so good, and this is the spooky bit, uh, Chrissy. So I hope you're paying attention. Why is it so good? It's a constrained, it's a constrained environment. It's graphically, it's, it's geographically constrained. It's a cold era. It's much like a, uh, um, a bucket, essentially. It's ringed by mountains. Nothing can escape from that environment. All the rain that falls inside the caldera it stays inside the caldera. There's one small creek system that escapes it. You can see that the, the alkaline intrusive, the cyanite granite, coming through from the middle, that's about 70 million years old. It's been weathering down on itself with these clays, and these rare earth molecules have got nowhere to go. 
It's a trapped audience. So they've been self-enriching on themselves. And that is why we are seeing, because of this control, this geographical control, we're seeing this enrichment of these rare earth elements. So Mother Nature has, uh, has really given us a major leg up there. Uh, this really shows the, the breadth of the licences that we have. So as I mentioned before, around 196 square kilometres of licences. It's about 20% 20, 20 of the cold era footprint. Uh, Alcoa are a major operator on the left-hand side that you can see. They've been there for around 70 odd years. Kurumbaba, another bauxite operator, are on the right-hand side. They've been in operation for around 30 to 40 years. So this is a brownfields mining area. And this is one of the reasons why we have such great community acceptance. The community are absolutely accepting of mining uh, within the cold era. They like the work that Alcoa have done in particular, and for that reason we are, we are uh, basically tailgating along on the good work that Alcoa has done uh, and with the community, and uh, we have that, uh, that licence to operate like this. So it's a, it's a great leg up, it's a great start for us at that local community level. We are infill drilling at the moment, but also uh, with a second rig that we have en route to country, we are doing all our, our infill drilling program is being run with our own rig. It's a, it's a much cheaper and quicker option for us to operate with. We've got our own drilling team. A second rig is in route. We are continuing to explore off resource licences. Uh, and we do that for two reasons, and that is DYTB. The heavies are super important in adding value to the basket, and we continue to search for those. We've got a large number of tenements that we need to work through, and unlocking the value of that, those heavy uh, rare earth elements is super, is super important to us. So we push on with two separate programs. We're exploring, and we're also infill drilling. Infill drilling, uh, is going to be giving us resource updates, the first of which will be coming to market very soon. Met test work, this was released, and I'm starting to whip through these because I can see I'm already starting to fall behind, Christy. Uh, and I promised you two minutes. Um, Met test work, so this is important. This is what is driving the value. This is what gives us our low operating costs. So you can see in the graph on the bottom left hand side, the blue numbers, the original recoveries. You can see the orange numbers. That's the recent ANSTO work which closes that gap. And it's all in that impurity removal phase and the precipitation down to the carbonate phase. So they've closed that gap. They've added that extra value. What does that mean as a throughput story? Every tonne of ore that we put through the plant, we were recovering around 1.9 kilos of TREO. Now we're recovering around 2.1, 2.2 kilos. That's the difference. That is the driver that, that lowers our operating cost. We recover more metal. The basket value stays the same. More metal, lower operating costs, more cash flow. Uh, the important thing there too is the impurity. So on their very first pass, this is an ANSTO uh, off-the-shelf test. There's no optimization work done here. They have produced a carbonate which is eminently saleable. There's all but one separator outside of uh, China that will take this, uh, this carbonate as it is. Uh, and uranium at 50 parts per million, completely acceptable to, to all but one. So it's a benign carbonate that we've produced. You can package it up, truck it, ship it anywhere in the world without any sort of placarding. It's a safe product. This is the focus for our uh, studies going forward. Uh, you can see the, pro the proposed process plant. You'll be seeing this coming out in the scoping study. That'll be coming out in, uh, in mid-May. We can't put that out at the moment. We're waiting on those measured indicated resources to come from the drilling that you can see in Suburbo and Capo de Mel. Once we have those two out, they'll be getting released sequentially over the next uh, couple of months. We'll reschedule, we'll get those tons and grade back through the financial model that we've already, we already have and we'll get those metrics out to market. And I'm looking forward to sharing that all with you because they're great numbers, they really are. Um, the reason we like this area too, there's all weather access roads. Uh, there's a 138 kVA power line, which runs directly with, to within half a kilometre of the site. 100% hydro powered. Power in that part of the world is around three cents a kilowatt hour. It's cheap, it's available, and we're ready to plug into it. Ample water in this area as well. And again, just on that flow sheet, and I guess this is where, this is where the improvements were made uh, in this impurity removal phase area. So that is, equates around 15% recoveries in rare earths which have improved in that space. So that's, as I said, that is what is driving, that's what's driven the recent uh, value kick uh, in, in driving our in, improved recoveries. Going forward, we continue our engineering with Osenko while we're having this, uh, this hiatus waiting for measured and indicated resources coming through. We are, uh, we are doing uh, extra engineering. We're moved into the feasibility stage. Uh, so that work is continuing. We've just recruited a GM of projects. He's a key guy going forward. Um, he's going to be driving. Uh, he's got a lot, a lot of work to do in a very short space of time. So we need that person in there to drive that process forward. 
environmental, that's progressing extremely well. We've got the EIS report that's been written, it's being reviewed at the moment by us, and that'll be getting submitted probably a week or two early, so we're ahead of schedule there. And that's important for our end of next year, uh, all important timeline. Uh, we're getting our permit to construct, we've been guaranteed that by the State Governor Minister Race as long as we comply. And so everything is on track for that, uh, for that uh, time frame. Metallurgy, we continue on. That's moving into a continuous piloting phase very shortly. Uh, so excited to see how that goes. Uh, all on track, the work is looking good there. And resource infill drilling, as I mentioned before, we've got resource updates coming to market very soon. Just very quickly, our relationship with the State Government and Minister Reyes. These are the guys that are helping us drive this permitting process. It's their time frames that we're operating to. And you can see the all important red diamond on the right hand side. That is our permit to construct. And that is what we're progressing towards. Looking forward, off-taking. So we've recently announced uh, our XM Bank of America $250 million letter of support. That's been well received. That's a great step forward for us. We're continuing with our off-takes. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thanks everyone for your time. That is spooky, that little colour there, that it all just lands in that bucket nicely for you. That was very well organised, I think. Right. On the 25th of January, Premier One Lithium sparked into being. They're one of the newest listings that you'll hear from here at the conference. And it's been an interesting backstory that he may like to share with you in more detail if you can go around to the booth later. In fact, some of their success is due to a revolutionary bit of AI tech that sadly for us in Australia is so good it's just been snapped up by international investors, but another bit of great West Australian tech that's made its way overseas. So Premier One is using advanced data analysis to target and develop assets in the Archean craters, cratons, excuse me, of Western Australia, which of course is known for its significant lithium bearing LCT pegmatites. Walk, 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 kick, walk, 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 kick, as Tony Rivera would say nicely. This is their executive director and CEO, Richard Taylor, and he's going to explain it all to us. Please make him welcome. Thanks, Chrissy. It's a pleasure to be here and a nice reference to Tony Rivera. I, I liked his story about a year ago being here uh, presenting and, um, and feels that uh, uh, Premier One's one of the few, well, brand new company um, in terms of we brought it to market. Uh, January 25, when we demerged from um, Sensor, which is an AI machine learning technology group, um, which is looking, um, moving to internationally, as uh, Chrissy was mentioning. Um, but we are right at the beginning of the journey. Um, we are um, you know, small cap, um, we've um, got some very significant, exciting results from uh, the, the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, being able to process very large continental scale data sets. Um, we're using advances or, or Sensor and um, Premier One have been using advances in um, AI and ML techniques. So uh, imagine if you can go and extract all of the reports over Western Australia or over the key mining areas be able to take out the key words, be able to geolocate them uh, within a, a, a space uh, and be able to turn those into quantitative data layers, um, be able to train uh, the computer to be able to do the job of a geochemist, be able to ingest, desurvey and integrate 70 million um, different types of um, surface assay samples across uh, the relevant areas, um, all of the drilling um, components there and be able to process it with the geophysics. So, um, the sensor technology that was developed, um, it, if you think about it, it is about preparing all of the ingredients to be able to make new discoveries and be able to really fast track um, the decision making processes in that regard. Um, so market cap's around 7 million. Um, we brought on um, as part of the demerger process Deutsche Rostoff out of Germany. Um, it follows on very much from some of the critical mineral stories we've heard about um, over the last couple of days. So, Europe is short of some of the key ingredients that it needs for its battery and critical minerals transition. Uh, Deutsche Rostov is investing heavily in downstream battery manufacturing um, areas and also is a large investor in many of the um, companies that you've heard from in the lithium space today. So they are at the forefront of many um, European country, companies that are looking at how they secure their supply and they see Western Australia um, where our projects are as one of the best places to go shopping um, for not only um, companies and assets, um, but also in the current downturn looking for um, opportunities to be able to grow on the M&A scale. 
um, given the downturn in the market at that point. So we have Anja Essa on our board from Deutsche Rostoff, a geologist, vice president of geology from, um, from uh, Deutsche Rostoff with experience working in Africa, Asia, and different parts of the world. Uh, Nick Lim is our chairman, um, previously developed projects in Senegal and Norway for mineral sands processes. Um, and we're very much, uh, I guess, still a tightly held um, stock, um, but very much built around the prospects of being able to grow um, and taking a long-term perspective on lithium, although probably at this point you do need to take a long-term perspective on lithium, um, and even despite some green shoots that we're seeing from the Abermail contracts. Um, so why invest in, in, um, in Premier One? Um, we have a leading position in one of what we believe to be one of the best jurisdictions in the world uh, for hard rock lithium, located um, on large features that we see coming out of the data that hosts some of the major mines for lithium in that area. Um, and I'll talk about two of the projects that we've got, um, Abbott's North near Mika Thara, and the Montague project in our joint venture with Gateway Mining. And these are a proof of concepts of what you can do when you can process vast amounts of data and be able to get to locations and be able to get on the ground quickly and effectively um, explore them and make decisions about exploration. So really shortening the process between um, an idea, a data generated idea, getting on the ground and being able to drill it and reaching a decision on size and economic potential faster than potentially other people can. Um, we have a lot of joint ventures with different companies that we've been able to, to uh, pull together for lithium. Um, we've recognised particularly that some of the best ground in Western Australia are held by gold companies, um, which are required by shareholders and others to be able to stay true to their, stick to their knitting, to be able to invest in gold. They may not be able to pivot to lithium in that process, but in that um, opportunity, the proximity from gold and lithium in, um, in the Archean area, we've been able to liberate um, a number of different lithium um, rights in that process and created value for um, our joint venture partners who otherwise would need to not be able to explore for those um, components. And as you see, um, some of those um, new potential deposits have been hiding in plain sight. Um, our first sort of discovery in this process was related to Abbott's North. Um, and so it's a great concept, really. You go from um, getting an output from um, a data machine saying, here are the high, pro high prospectivity correlation areas from multi-physics and geochemistry and geology, all the ingredients are in this location, but it's not previously known for lithium. No lithium exploration, gold exploration, gold assays only. Um, we send out our teams onto the field. We go and look for uh, fertile pegmatite areas. Um, and we come back here with um, one and a quarter percent lithium oxide from pegmatites outcropping on the surface. So um, I think there is um, a lot in this and that there is a lot more new discoveries to be made in Western Australia as we really refine the toolkit for Greenfield's lithium exploration. As many of you might know, many of the um, lithium mines started their life as maybe tin or tantalum uh, projects and that we're really still looking at the early days of how you create the exploration toolkit for lithium. It hasn't been helped by the fact that in the assay process uh, for many years we were using a, a lithium flux, lithium um, to be able to do assays and it meant that um, unless you particularly wanted to assay for lithium and before the battery revolution came through there were potentially not as many reasons to assay for lithium um, and it means that lithium in the WA um, data sets is one of the least assayed for uh, uh, metals um, within the suite. So, We've been doing innovative things with our, our geochemical um, uh, geochemists and with our AI to be able to reconstruct that missing lithium element from the pathfind elements that are, um, have been historically assayed for. So pretty exciting, revolutionary stuff. Um, so wh where are our projects? Um, you can see Abbott's North there near Mikathara. Um, it's 40 minutes from um, the town mining, very large sort of historical mining center. Uh, Western Gold is sort of operating um, very close to the town there. Uh, we've been based out very easily from, um, from the centre of uh, the town um, and just drive 40 minutes to site along historic um, uh, hall roads from many legacy operations there. So again, showing that correlation between fertile gold um, and lithium, not together, um, but proximate and um, within that um, sometimes called Goldilocks zone. Um, but also we can quantifiably look at, quantify um, where that can be 
uh, based on looking at the granite predictions and other things in those locations. Uh, you can see on the map as well, the um, major lithium producers and lithium occurrences right across the, the Yilgarn. It might be a bit small on that one, but you can see the major structures that seem to be pulling together many of the um, lithium trends in that area. Um, we think that there are other parts of that, um, of the systems in, in the Yilgarn, uh, which uh, can host um, potentially uh, as many discoveries as have been um, on that Mount Marion uh, Kathleen Valley trend that you can see highly represented there. So um, that's where we're looking out around Yalgu, um, Gecko North, uh, Montague and Abbots North. So just turning to talk a little bit about our flagship project Abbots North, you can see that it's in a, a favourable um, favourable uh, lithology, uh, hosted in the, the Mafex tracheography right near a fertile granite. Um, when we're looking at the, the Goldilocks zone, um, we've got to think about it in 3D. Um, there are multiple granite um, potential hosts in this area. And so we're continuing to learn more and more as we um, get onto the ground. It's important we, we raised $3 million back in December, probably at the very um, sort of end of, uh, or as, as lithium prices sort of came down uh, very quickly. Uh, we were able to get on the ground and be able to drill in this project by February. It shows that we're operating in a jurisdiction that's very friendly to mining, um, that has um, community support in that area, um, that land access um, is uh, important to go through the process, but it can happen really quickly. We can go from idea, project acquisition, uh, field work and drilling within a two to three month period and be able to refine and gather more information and be able to um, pull that information uh, into our learning model and be able to um, further vector towards where we see um, opportunities there. So we completed our first drill program, uh, very uh, quick scout program um, in February. We're waiting for assays at the moment. Um, we're already into phase two heritage clearance of that area based on uh, work we've done with ERM and some of the experts in lithium. They've identified more opportunities within that portfolio for us to be able to follow up on very rapidly into a second RC program. Um, so you can see uh, when, we, when our geologists went to the field, um, these are the pegmatites that outcrop. Um, the intervening areas there are covered by a shallow uh, cover um, location. So we can track those um, pegmatites uh, continuously over about a one and a half kilometer area of strike uh, between 0.8% and one and a quarter percent um, lithium um, on surface. Um, we're seeing the, I guess, the surface expression being relatively narrow, but um, looking at counter projects that have happened, it can blow out very quickly around structures and other areas. So we see that the fertility elements, the fractionation, the potassium, whole rock potassium rubidium ratios, and other items that we're looking at to be able to vector towards new lithium targets are, are showing up strongly in this location. Um, we looked at uh, also doing quite a bit of um, geochemistry work, which is showing um, uh, further targets to the north and to the east. Uh, so I guess when we, when we drilled, uh, RC drilling down to about 200 metres, uh, indicated um, intercepted sort of swarms of um, pe pegmatites over that area, uh, multiple phases in that component, um, and it's putting us towards saying, where are these going to blow out into larger areas? So we're waiting for the assays. We think it's going to be, they're, they're going to have, um, uh, the visually is quite strong and interesting. Um, and there are opportunities as we move under shallow area where we'll be able to get larger and better um, and bigger um, potential in that location. Some of the work we've also done with the, um, the geochemistry ratios uh, also is validated by the work with ERM. That northern area is very exciting. The eastern area undercover. Um, the surface geochemistry is showing a very good uh, ability to be able to pick up additional targets um, once you're not near the colluvium component. Um, we've also been out on Montague. This is a joint venture with um, Gateway Mining. Um, you can see in the dotted line the predicted target from purely AI-generated um, information uh, from desktop work. This highlighted the structure in this area, uh, an area with no previous um, lithium exploration, um, and, but it's largely on mining leases, so it's quite easy to get in and work very quickly. Our field mapping program has literally just completed. You can see that there are multiple pegmatites that have been mapped over that area um, using LIBS and XRF. We've got good numbers coming back from surface. We know we're in a fertile system, has good potassium rubidium um, ratios to be able to work with, and we're pretty excited about what we want to see. Um, 
we're seeing big structures there. We're seeing a quite a contiguous uh, with the pegmatites between what the AI was predicting and where the pegmatites have been found on the ground um, and big structures that can um, host uh, large projects. Um, similarly with uh, Yalgu, where Firetail um, has the um, intervening area between our Yalgu West and our Yalgo tenement. Um, they have historical lithium pegmatites there grading up to three and a quarter percent um, lithium. Um, they have been on the RC program and encountered fertile pegmatites in that, that area of the AI target, which we've identified. So we know that the AI is getting us into the right locations and it's doing it time and time again. So our ability to get on and explore, drill, determine where there's going to be potential for large projects is excellent. We have a great team behind us and backing to be able to achieve it. Um, We'll be on the ground here in Yalgu. It's a very big area. It's a very large target. We've got multi-commodity multi um, rights in this area, and it's going to be the next cab off the rank for us. Um, so the key takeaways in relation to Premier One, um, we have an excellent building portfolio of greenfields opportunities in an area we think as being one of the best jurisdictions for getting on the ground fast, getting land access, and being able to drill and test in places where you don't have to wait for a very long period of time. Abbott's North is showing that we can get um, the right aspects and the right um, grades and be able to develop our team and be able to uh, turn over projects quickly. Uh, we're excited about Montague, we're excited about Yalgu, and we're excited about the opportunity uh, to be able to do further deals with um, Gold and other companies to be able to grow this with the backing of Deutsche Rostov. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. It's interesting use of technology, isn't it? Now, when I was doing some work with the Stockhead last year, I interviewed our next company up on stage, Green Technology Metals. And they're a really experienced team behind this mob. And if you're a fan of Rick Rule at all and follow him, you'll know that he's actually used this team as an example of when he's looking for investments, he always looks at the depth of knowledge of a team and he actually pulled up Green Technology Metals team as a great example. But the deposit you have, though, isn't that bad either, quite frankly. Uh, it's the Root Bay deposit. It's already one of the largest spodumene uh, resources identified in Canada, the most significant one in Ontario. It's located to the north of the industrial hub of Thunder Bay, where Green Technology Metals is planning to construct a downstream processing hub. And the gentleman that's going to tell us all about it, one of those knowledgeable blokes, and if I read your bloomin' bio, it's this long, so I've just thrown that one out, I'm sorry. This is ED. Cameron Henry, would you please make him welcome? Thank you very much, Chrissy, and great to be up here presenting uh, the at the Tribeca uh, Future Minerals Conference. Uh, we've had a very long relationship with Tribeca, so it's great to be presenting for the first time. Uh, so for those that haven't actually uh, seen green technology medals before or, or seen me present before, uh, one of the most important things that we do actually talk about is our um, First Nations uh, partners that we acknowledge and Having the ability to op operate in their lands and uh, continue to develop projects in their region is a huge part of our uh, business. So we certainly acknowledge that as we go forward. Uh, so green technology, are we oversold or undervalued? It's a big question for a lot of people. Um, obviously we're in a pretty dire lithium market, have been for the last sort of six months, but uh, certainly from the people that we talk to, which is uh, you know, in very in, in long depth strategics, OEMs and all the likes, the lithium market is certainly very alive and still here, and they're all very positive of the future. So we see it's a great time to be investing. Um, certainly, I've been putting my money back into the company, which is probably what shareholders want to see. Uh, but uh, I think now is a very good time to be looking at uh, companies that like ourselves. Um, we've got a register, I think, for the size of a junior that not many, not many others have with strategics on the, on the register, such as AMCI Group, um, LG Energy Solutions, uh, Waratah Capital, Lithium Americas, and Promero Group. Uh, so very strong strategic register that obviously back uh, our assets and back the team uh, that we will get these into production and get them going soon. Uh, so company highlights. Since we listed the company two years ago, um, we, we picked up the assets. We had about three to four million tonnes in a drawback resource. Uh, we've now increased that to nearly 25 million tonnes at just over 1.13 lithium oxide. So. Um, we, we've continued to grow that resource and we will continue to grow that resource. There's absolutely huge amounts of spodumene in the area. They're, they're extremely fertile pegmatites, high grade, very clean, and that's what attracts us to the whole area of Ontario to start with. Um, we've got about 56,000 hectares, which is a huge um, land holding in northwestern Ontario. 
Uh, we have 10 projects um, that are mainly made up of our Eastern and Western Hub, which is the Seymour and the Root project and the surrounding, um, uh, surrounding projects very close. We also have other really large land packages through the region. Um, 2026 will be our first planned production. Uh, we're still on track for that. Uh, we do plan to be the first spodge bean producer in Ontario, which will give us a huge advantage as we move forward with the rest of our plans as well. Uh, and you know, at this early, early stage and within sort of 18 months of even listing, we had our first official offtake, um, a binding offtake agreement with uh, LG Energy Solutions for 25% of that first concentrator. As you can see, we're, we're um, situated very close to Thunder Bay. Our project's only 324 and 506 kilometres from Thunder Bay. So it's a huge advantage when we're talking about uh, moving and logistics and tra trucking uh, concentrate down to a central conversion facility. It is part of our strategy, uh, and I'll run you through that today as well. Uh, so the three-stage three, three stage strategy, as you can see here, is, is to start with our Seymour project, which is our first modest uh, resource. Uh, when we picked up the project, it already had some um, baseline data done on, on the project, so we were right into it from head start, and we started to continue with that baseline the first day we started drilling. So we've now completed that. We've taken it a very long way along the line to being permitted. Uh, and then hence why we think we can be in production in, in 2026. So the idea there is to produce uh, a DMS concentrator, uh, concentrate, um, it's very coarse, very competent rock, um, and we'll you know, use that as a starter project to get into production and get into early cash flows. Uh, the second part of our, of our strategy is to partner with some of the world's leading groups uh, to build the lithium conversion facility. Now, very lofty um, ambitions for a junior at, of, at the moment, a 60, 50, 60 million dollar market cap to be sitting here saying that we will build lithium, lithium conversion, but certainly we won't, won't be funding it. We'll be partnering with some of the biggest and best operators that currently produce chemicals uh, in the world at the moment. And we will use our knowledge and our skill set to, to develop the mines, and we will assist them also in, uh, in the lithium conversion facility. Uh, the third part of the strategy is the Root Lithium Project. Now, this is certainly shaping up to be uh, a real company maker for, for us as a project. Uh, we only started drilling there about 15 months ago. We've, we've uh, already established about 15 million tonnes at 1.2% uh, Li2O, so, and we've already got uh, 10 million in the indicated category. So we've been drilling the Root Bay Project out, and I'll run through that a bit later, but we certainly think that this will underpin probably 15 years of mine life, even up to 20 years of mine life, to feed uh, lithium conversion into the future. Uh, so advancing towards production. Um, we've already done a lot of many, uh, well, ticked off many of these uh, bullet points on the left. Um, we've, we've completed our first PEA, which was a completely integrated PEA with two mines and a lithium conversion facility. Very co comprehensive document, if anyone wants to read it, about a thousand pages. Uh, but it did show some really strong economics uh, and that gave us, gives us the opportunity to then move forward and continue to developing our assets. Uh, we've got strategic partnerships that we've developed um, through our knowledge and, and I guess our, 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 our friends and, and uh, partners in the industry. Um, we've app submitted our application for st st the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is funding for the uh, conversion facility in Canada. We were the first ones to submit that in Ontario. Um, we've got our mining lease granted for Seymour. We've received our environmental class. Um, we've got our first offtake that we've completed, and we've got uh, some very good metallurgy that allows us to have simple uh, processing infrastructure, which is a huge advantage to have. Uh, so what are we doing at the moment at Seymour? Um, we're about to start our maiden, maiden, maiden drilling program at Junior Lake, which is uh, a new project about 15 kilometres to the east. We've got walk-up uh, walk, walk targets there. We, we've already established a very fertile pegmatites with Grab samples up to three and a half percent. This year, we're looking at completing a definitive feasibility study, um, which will hopefully lead, lead us to a financial investment decision, obviously market depending. Um, and we're looking to starting to clear this year in early works. Um, the approvals process that we're going through at the moment, um, we currently have a draft closure plan, which is probably the, the final tick in, in the box for receiving our permits to construct. Uh, we're continue our, continuing our Indigenous consultation and our minor permitting approvals that we're still continuing with as well. Uh, and that will lead us to mid-year sort of further discussions on financing and finalising the rest of our offtake um, with potential project level investment and also government funding. So that's all in the Seymour project. So as you can see, we're pretty busy and uh, continuing to advance that project. Uh, on the conversion facility, we're continuing our site selection. Uh, we do have a site selected at, at currently, and that's what we've studied. But uh, at the moment, we, we want to complete our partnering process, which will also determine 
uh, our flow sheet selection and potentially uh, a joint venture in, in the making uh, on the horizon. Um, so we'll kick into a pre pre preliminary feasibility study as well. Um, we're looking at also working with that group uh, or two groups to fund that as we go forward, which will also help us with, uh, I guess, cash flow and burden on the, on the business being a, a junior developer. Um, the root project, that is the game, the, game, the game changer for the company as far as uh, resource size. Uh, we've got a 10,000 metre drilling program that we're currently um, are working on and designing and we will kick into the PFS next year. But that 10,000 metre program will, will really be key to, I think, uh, a lot of resource upgrades in the area. Uh, and we'll be continuing with project, project description submission and baseline studies not to delay development possibility at root. Uh, so why Ontario? Uh, we just had um, Nick talk about first, first lithium in, in Western Australia and how much of a great jurisdiction it is. Um, look, Ontario is completely different. It is an ecosystem that's been set up. It's ready for um, a complete mine to EV supply chain. Now, it has world-class infrastructure up there. I mean, why do we select our projects in Ontario? Our, our projects are very close to in infrastructure. They have roads, they have power, they have uh, you know, networks and communities not too far away. But the provincial uh, government within Ontario as well has established uh, the Building More Mines Act and they are, they are actually just been rated the number, one, uh, the number one jurisdiction to be developing lithium projects, well, not in battery metals projects in the world. And the reason they've done that is that there is huge amounts of government support there is a complete supply chain there from cathode active material to cell manufacturing to EV manufacturing all within 1,200 kilometres of where our mines are established. It's a great gateway to the US, which obviously has a huge market and huge government funding as well available. Um, and it is basically the only place in, in the world which has six of the largest EV or, or in car manufacturers in the, in the province. So there's not many places like that in the world that you can, you can say you can develop uh, uh, mining projects when you have automakers that are all within 1,200 kilometres of, of your mines. So we think it's a great place to develop. Um, there is 28 billion that's being committed at the moment from some of these automakers and cell manufacturers. Um, there is a huge amount of capacity that requires lithium hydroxide in, in Ontario itself and $3 billion of government funding that's available to people like us uh, applying to, to, for grants and for debt packages to build our projects. Uh, so, <clears throat> on the gateway itself, it's a little bit more, I think, uh, you know, information. I mean, here's our projects here, just to the left. Really is the gateway to the whole of northwest Ontario. Now, northwest Ontario has huge amounts of, of spodumene, uh, has some really amazing deposits, and there's going to be a lot more found. The thing about Ontario is it's, it's quite hard to find uh, spodumene because you can't just sort of look on Google Earth and see uh, outcropping pegmatites. You've got to actually work hard for your exploration. As you can see here, we've got the electric corridor, which is down where all the auto, automo automotive makers are. Um, here they all are here with cell manufacturing, cell manufacturing, um, EVs, EVs and, and uh, cathode active material. Um, and then down to the US with one of our biggest shareholders, LG Energy Solutions, which is building multiple uh, cam and cell manufacturing facilities down here in, in the US as well. So some more detail, this is Seymour, our eastern hub. Uh, we just have these new images rendered, uh, so you can sort of see we are moving very close to development. Um, there's about 10.3 million tonnes there that we have in our resource. Uh, we've done about 75,000 metres of drilling, so we're really confident on, on uh, the resource itself. And we still have an exploration target uh, when we get back into the fields to continue exploration to, to, uh, to, to grow that resource. Um, Seymour, uh, the North Aubrey itself is the main deposit. Uh, you can see here it's sort of one thick pegmatite, uh, starts from surface and got really good grades at surface. Um, strip ratio is quite, you know, it's quite challenging once we get down to this sort of 150 metre level. But once we get down near here, we've got sort of 19 metres, 20 metres, gets about 40 metres thick in the middle. At, you know, there's, a, there's some uh, drilling we re re released only a couple of weeks ago, 24, uh, 24 metres at 2.7%. So extremely high grade very coarse, uh, low in iron, very competent rock, uh, probably some of the best spodumene that I've seen and I've certainly looked at probably about 30 or 40 projects over the world. Um, so that's the, the starter pit and the first, um, you know, first five years of mine life there at North Aubrey. Uh, we're certainly very, very comfortable with, I guess, the economics of that pit being developed. 
Um, as I mentioned before, we're talk talking about our, our Junior Lake project, which is where we will be drilling uh, this, this year and looking at uh, all these other targets, walk-up targets we have. Um, nearly 20 kilometres away, but like a lot of lithium projects, uh, multiple projects have multiple pits. Uh, so we do see this as a bit of a camp. We've only explored just this little area here around uh, North Albury. We've got walk-up targets here with over 3% um, grade, uh, so we'll certainly be drilling those this summer, the Canadian summer that is, probably autumn, uh, and making sure that uh, we've got a, more inventory to add uh, in, into in, and increase the mine life. There's, uh, well, really good opportunities and it's actually shown in, uh, in other parts of Canada where you can all sort and actually just truck to the, to the plant. So there really is, I think, uh, a good opportunity to develop a camp and there's multiple other projects in the area as well. I better hurry up. Um, Production in, in Seymour, look, it is a no chemical, very simple process, um, low environmental footprint, and, and we've got a zero discharge site, which does allow us to move the permanent uh, board forward very quickly. Um, conversion facility, some nice rendered images here. If you look really closely, it's already been built. Look at that. Um, this, is, this is what we studied, which was actually the Metal Tech flow sheet. We will be looking at other opportunities as we go forward. But as I said, we'll, uh, we'll update the market. Once we have a partner on board, and we will be moving forward into the PFS, but uh, we found a good site. It's an amazing area. There's available power. There's there's great logistics. It's uh, it's an amazing hub, and there's huge government and local support to develop in the area. There's a couple more nice pictures. Uh, the Western Hub. This is Root. Uh, this is going to be our, going to be our largest project. There's 15 million tons or 14.6 million tons already. We've moved into the studies, we've developed a more a hybrid sort of flotation and DMS, which is a much bigger concentrator. Um, we will be drilling here this year. This is the Root Bay deposit itself. We've discovered more pegs here on the Root Bay East area, and we're certainly will be drilling to, into the Root Bay Deeps area as well. Um, hugely prospective for underground. Um, we've increased our, our exploration targets up to, to 25 to 35 million tonnes. Uh, we've got Root Bay East as well, which has got some intersections of up to 23 metres at 1.16. So, I'm being kicked off. There's the there's the flow sheet for Root, um, which is will be a more complex, but uh, we will be will be back into cash flow by these by this time, and uh, we'll be an established company, so it'll be easier to develop. And we have a very busy year ahead, which I've pretty much covered all the highlights, um, but certainly look forward to further updates in the coming months. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks, everyone. And a lot to get through. You should have put the 20 minute version, I think. Hey, um, I really love the confidence of our next presenter up here on stage. He announced his company to me as potentially the most successful junior explorer to list in 2023. He was pretty proud about it. I think like most of you here today, that I've done a bit of a deep dive into the companies that are presenting up on stage. And I thought, well, actually you've got a pretty good reason to be excited and wanting to get up on the stage and share it with us. So they're a major grant holder in a region that's described as one of Western Australia's hottest success stories in terms of exploration discoveries. It's called the West Arunta. Uh, would you please welcome a man who is energised by the potential in 2024 of CGN Resources, their MD, Stan Willey. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, everyone for attending to hear our story. For those of you who don't know our story, CGN Resources stands for Copper, Gold, Nickel, but we're also looking for critical metals uh, out there. And we only floated in October last year. Um, we were, as Christina alluded to, I think we were very successful for a junior exploration company. We were successful at raising 10 million, which I think speaks to the quality of our projects, uh, the quality of the management and board, I suppose. Um, and, if there's four things I guess I want you to take away from today's uh, presentation, it's probably these four. Uh, the location of our project uh, is in probably one of the hottest districts at the moment. Um, we've got a large strategic land holding there. It's a contiguous thousand square kilometre package uh, right in the middle of the West Arunta region. We've got quality neighbours all around us who are having success, so WA1, Encounter, um, uh, Rio Tinto, IGO are all there with quite big land holdings and uh, committing literally like 50 to 70 million dollars uh, in exploration money. So I think that says something about the district. Um, our company ourselves, as a private company, spent seven million dollars before we listed uh, doing various geoscience projects. We're a company that really values good geoscience. I think uh, to be successful in the exploration space, you need to have a clear understanding of what you're going there to look for 
uh, and then doing the geoscience in an iterative and uh, I guess disciplined manner to um, deliver on those on your on your ideas. So we had seven million dollars spent, which gave us a really great uh, I guess pool of geoscience data, which we've now uh, honed down to six high priority targets, targeting IOCG, uh, nickel, sulphides, and rare earths. Uh, and I think the important part for a, a you know a junior exploration company is that we're very well funded. Uh, we've still got 8.5 million dollars in the bank, uh, and that kind of gives us enough money to deliver on our project uh, pipeline that I'll run through a bit later. So we've got 110 million shares uh, on offer, uh, and thankfully. Since we've listed, we've, we've had a pretty positive reception. Uh, our share price today was as high as it's been. It got up to 32 cents after a listing price of 20 uh, in a pretty tough market for junior exploration. I won't lie, I'm pretty happy. Um, but I think that also talks to our investor base. So the, the light blue section there is, is the directors and management. We're all big believers. We put in our own money and have worked hard uh, for free for a couple of years to, to um, to get this thing off the ground. That, that next 32 is a bunch of our advisors and a series of high net worth investors that we curated as a group that love resource investing. So the stock is tightly held uh, and you'll see that if you look on market. Like, there's no one really selling at the moment, which is really good for us uh, because I think everyone is really looking forward to seeing what we do this year with our expiration dollars. We've got a, a, a well-credentialed board and really good advisors from a technical sense. Uh, Daryl, our chairman, has been in the industry for 40 years. He's been an MD before, he's been a chairman before. Um, Grant Mooney is a non-executive director, I think, on five ASX listed companies. He's a chartered accountant and a very uh, experienced company secretary. Uh, and I'm a geologist, probably the weakest one on the group, but I have been around, I have been around a long time and I've done a lot of work all over the world. Uh, in a consulting sense, and it give, it's, what that gives me is a, is a great network of experts that I can call upon when I need them. Uh, I, you know, I alluded to it before, we've got a great address, like all of those companies are very active and have had quite considerable success. If you go and look up any one of those and have a look at their price charts, uh, you'll see, well maybe not IGO, they haven't had a great run, but <laughs> the, the other ones uh, have all made discoveries and IGO has as well. Um, so go and take a look at those. We're quite fortunate. We got out there very early uh, in 2010 and um, JV'd into this piece of ground. The original owners were looking for diamonds and they were quite successful at doing that, but now no one's really interested in funding diamond exploration. But it has allowed us to get this very strategic land holding uh, within what is, a, if you go back five years on that picture, that's what the West Arunta looked like. You throw a discovery by WA1 in there and now there is no ground left in the West Arunta and you'll see lots of other companies uh, starting to talk about it. It's not just us and our neighbours, like academia has known that this area is highly prospective for IOCG and large magmatic systems. Um, that's what took us there in the first place. Uh, it's got the right age rocks, it's got known deposits now, like if you look at that purple bit, uh, where's the pointer here? So this uh, bit is the Arunta region, where similar rocks occur, Ernest Henry, Olympic Dam, over here at Broken Hill, those are pretty good jurisdictions and to not have a big red blob uh, somewhere in here is a bit unusual, so we're the ones we hope are going to find that big red blob. Um, we've got six priority targets. These are our six targets that we've done the most work on. There's probably another 10 targets that sit below this as second tier targets, I suppose, or, or targets that need a little bit more work. Um, four of those are IOCG targets, one's a rare earth and one is a nickel target. Um, our, our next cab off the rank is gonna be the Surus target. It's a large um, regional gravity anomaly. Um, it's got Coincident IP conductors, it's adjacent to major crustal scale uh, structures, which is what you want for IOCG type targets. Snorky and Horton are similar. Uh, Hathi is a geochemical and geophysical target. We've, we've already intersected 37 metres at 0.38 total rare earths. That, that hole was actually looking for uh, diamonds in a, in a kimberlite hole, so it's kind of bycatch from that, but it's in a very interesting location. Uh, and Shep interestingly as well, has two metres at 1.5% nickel, but that's in a broader zone above half a percent that sits over 30 metres. 
we interpreted it from the magnetics on that, that perhaps there was a, an ultramafic system or ultramafic sills in there. They were unknown in that region, but as soon as we listed, we went and did some uh, heritage work. We drilled a hole at the Tantor, de uh, at the Tantor deposit uh, and intersected those previously unknown uh, ultramafics, and they are elevated in nickel. Now we just need to hopefully find the sulphide component of that. I don't really have time to go into all of the targets in the same level of detail, so I'll probably stick to Surus, but I think the important takeaway is that we are well funded and we have a number of uh, programs that we're going to touch all of those six high priority targets with. Um, we've done the ground-based geophysics listed there, so we've done ground gravity, we've done some IP, uh, we're just wrapping up the EM literally in the, in the next couple of days, and then we transition to drilling. And um, we will drill originally Surus. We have $220,000 in grant funding from the West Australian Government to assist us with that. It's going to be a deep diamond hole, 650 uh, metres deep, right into the heart of our target. Uh, and then we will transition to some RC drilling over Shep and Hathi, and then probably do some diamond drilling later in the year. Fortunately, we have very good relations uh, with the traditional owners here, and so we have all of our tenure in a land access agreement. Uh, which has a structure for how we go through getting permits in place to do the work we want to do. Uh, as soon as we listed last year, um, we partnered with uh, the traditional owner, the Kiwakura people, and permitted a bunch of all those red dots of drill programs that we can do should we have success at any one or more of these. And we're fortunate that we have the cash backing to be very flexible in how we deploy it. Uh, and so any success at any one of these, we can scale up our exploration and really define what, what we've found. Surus is a very uh, compelling target, I think. It, it, like a, it's, a, it's a kind of colourful picture, but I guess the key takeaway is it's, it's a regionally significant gravity target. Uh, it's, a, it's a dense body sitting up against a major structure um, that runs all the way. It's like a 30 kilometre long structure that runs up past WA1's discovery. Uh, we've just recently finished an IP survey there, which has a, a, a conductor coincident with the gravity, and, and a conductor means that it, it may contain sulphides. Uh, the, well, sulphide-bearing bodies often do have conductance and, uh, and are also chargeable, and this has both of those. Uh, just looking at this picture, um, these are ISO surfaces. That grey bit in the middle is the densest part. Um, and then the colourful image behind it is the conductor. You can see they sit together and our hole will go down and penetrate that and it'll give us a very good view of what we need to look at. Snorky and Horton are very similar. Uh, they will see some uh, drilling this year and uh, it looks like I'm getting wound up here. I think the important thing is we're going out and doing real high quality exploration over the year with the money we raised. and. I look forward to you uh, joining us on that journey. We've got the cash, we've got the projects, we've got the time, let's get it done. Thanks very much. <laughs> well done. Okay, well done. Uh, three companies left to hear from, Dave. Three opportunities left for you to put into your little list of uh, companies. One at the end, geez, worth listening to, that one at the end, wait till you hear from him. We're gonna start though with Terrain, uh, Terrain Minerals Limited. Now they're an active ASX exploration company, 100% uh, owned projects, and their aim is to achieve a company making discovery in 2024. So Terrain, Terrain has repositioned its exploration activities towards future facing commodities. Firmly, it's just, you're just doing Australia, aren't you? Nowhere else, just Australia. Just Australia, yeah. Just Australia, okay. Yep. And this big tall fella here is the company's executive director. This is Justin Virgin. And he's going to present to us the value proposition of Terrain. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Thanks for staying around to listen. So we've been moving the company towards rare earth, gallium, nickel and copper. We do have some gold um, as well. Let's jump through. Portrait statement references. So why terrain? Why do you need to be a shareholder? Rare earth elements, we've got them extending over nine kilometres, by about two or three kilometres, so a large zone. Unexpectedly, we're drilling something else and these are what come up. We're using a 1,000 ppm cutoff, which is looking pretty right at the moment, 23% um, trio, and our NDPR is 80% uh, average. Only 25% of the results have actually come back 
there's over 5,000 metres due in the next four to six weeks, which is, weeks, which is pretty exciting. Well, once we get them back, we're hoping to go straight into a resource drill out um, starting June, and we should have something by the end of the year. Also, our Lort River project, which is in West Australia as well, which is down near the Port of Esperance. We have potential Nova Nikolai feature, which we've discovered with some recent pegging, and we're basically down there for our rare earth and gallium as well in clays. We're about, we've already got a conductor on this, and then we're doing an EM survey in April, probably towards the end. And we've got a strong pipeline of lithium in the Pilbara and copper gold in Queensland, which are projects should be granted in the next six months. It's a pretty typical junior capital structure, 2.4 million billion on issue. Uh, 6 million market cap, 85% of the registered in the top 200 supportive shareholders. Board of three, um, Johannes Lin is a Singaporean national and his fa family's been on the board for a long time and keen supporters. As you can see, most of our projects are scattered across Western Australia and that's our commodity spread. So Smokebush is 350 kilometres north of Perth, about 80 k south of Golden Grove, which most people know. We've got 300, and 300 square kilometres tenure, and it's in the merging Midwest high-grade rare earth district. We've got proven um, clays, they're all high-grade for gallium and rare earths, uh, and we're close to existing infrastructure, which is pretty positive for a junior. So our maiden drill program was 2,500 metres with a deeper regolith that became 6,000. Chips of the future, silicon's out. Um, your components draw less power, so you can allow for miniaturisation, so it's a strong business case for Gallium. That's our work program going forward. Our Lort River project. So we're originally down there for rare earth and Gallium clays. It's 650 kilometres from Perth, about 50 k's from the port of Esperance. Um, with a new tenement we just picked up, we've just got a Nova, Nova feature right, which most people know are serious resources. And that's our I feature here. And that's a Nova feature. We're in the Albany Fraser Belt. We're in the southern part of the belt. The northern part's over explored. The southern part is on farming land, so it's quite exciting. We know these things come in clusters. Nickel's probably not the most exciting thing at the moment, but it will be in a few years' time. Um, we know IGO purchased Nova from Sirius for $1.8 billion, so there's a bit of value proposition. Um, and our EM surveys to start. You can see the belt here where Nova was and where we are down here in the farming district. And we've also got a conductor to state government's flow on, so it's pretty exciting to already have one at the beginning. We're 300 k's away basically from Nova down to here. So. A Lort River Gallium project. We've also drilled 16 holes long roadways. Um, seven of the drill holes came in with strong rare earths and gallium in every single hole almost from surface. And some of the drill results we have here. 
and we're planning to go back. We've learned a lot from that program. We're going back some larger paleo channels, which we'll be drilling out, but we can only drill out during the off-crop seasons. And we're part of a government research survey um, that's going on and basically some network, which should be pretty exciting. It's taking a very different approach to a couple of other companies in the area. Um, I think people will be surprised with the results when they come out. So it's our work program there. Thanks. So why terrain, smoke bush Lawrence Lane, clay, rare earths and gallium. It's located in an emerging high grade area. Only 25% of the samples back. We've got 5,000 metres pending in the next few weeks. Um, and hopefully we'll be on our way to resource drought. Our Lord River Nikolai and Clay River Earth Project, extensive mineralisation across the whole package. We have an exciting eye feature with a conductor on there already. The eye feature is on a farming land again, it hasn't really been looked at. Made an AM survey about to commence and we'll do a follow up drilling. And also we've got some high grade copper and gold on our Queensland project and our lithium projects. How much time we got left? Two minutes. So I'll quickly jump into our Kalindi project. It's about 90 k's out of Port Hedland. Two minutes, yep. So we're definitely in the right area. We've got wild, whoops. We've got wildcat and Cali metals here. We've got Pilgungura is about 50 k's away. We've got 839 square kilometres. We're planning to do a soil program. We're in the right rocks with most of our project. Um, it's all under cover. No one really knows what's there, so it'll be coming up in about six months. And our Queensland bit away project is north of Krakow. So here we have nine walk-up drill targets, and there's ten historic copper mines and workings on the area which have never been drilled or looked at before in the past. So we're very excited about having that coming up in the next six months for the company as well. Got plenty of time. And our Muckabooden project is also pending, and the main thing with Muckabooden, our neighbours are Rio Tinto and IGO, with niobium, yttrium and fluorine pegmatites. We're waiting to get on the ground there as well. So we've got a nice strong pipeline. We've only really got two active projects at the moment, but we're going to make sure that we've got some good quality assets to move forward with. And that's me finished. Yeah, all good. Thank you. I wasn't sure because I love the way you present. You're up with you backwards and you're having a chat with us. I wasn't sure there's a little bit more there. Andrew Warland, and I must admit too that I was just um, trying to do a bit of a dive into what was happening with your mob, Mr. Warland, because you've had lots of news recently. There's a place uh, in Western Australia called Collie, and it used to be where all our power was, uh, was produced. and it, it's been closed down, closed down. It's been a bit, bit sad for Collie as of late. And the government in Western Australia is really pushing hard to make Collie some sort of a, an industrial centre and a power centre in the future. And these guys here that are up on stage now have achieved quite a spectacular feat in the last month or so. So I'm going to pass you on this international graphite is who we're talking about. This is Andrew Warlander and some really interesting news to share with you all. So please pay attention and take a couple of notes. <coughs> Thanks, Chrissy, for a warm introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for hanging back. Ten minutes I've got uh, to try and convince you with the theme of uh, this conference that we'll be a 10-bagger in 12 months. So I'm on a bag a minute pace. So let's get into it. International Graphite is a graphite mining and processing company based in Western Australia. We have uh, the Springdale Graphite Project located on the south coast of Western Australia, uh, and we plan to build, and, uh, uh, build a graphite concentrator down there, mine the concentrate, produce a concentrate and, and truck that to Collie where we'll have uh, downstream processing facilities and ultimately supply the battery anode um, industry. Just wanted to pause on the capital structure of international graphite for a while. Those that uh, have been following our announcements will have seen a transaction we announced with our major shareholder last week. I won't go into the details of that, it's on the ASX website, but the important piece for this particular slide is that uh, the board and management and insiders of International Graphite account for 45% of the stock through direct ownership um, and through the control of Comet Resources, our other major shareholder. So we've uh, got a very tight capital structure for the company. 
um, with 55% of the capital structure in the hands of retail shareholders. Uh, the, we have 166 million shares on issue. We haven't raised any money since listing, which we're coming up to the two year anniversary of that in uh, just the other side of Easter. Below International Graphite, you'll see our projects. Uh, on the left hand side is the what we've got in Collie at the moment. We've established over the last two years a research and development centre for graphite processing. Uh, we have a micronising and spheroidising capability at pilot scale in there, and we've just expanded that to add uh, what we call qualification scale micronising equipment. Our next step at Collie is to build out that facility and put in place a commercial scale micronising plant, which will have enormous benefits for us as we work our way through the battery anode process, which I'll expand on. A Springdale Graphite Project is a 100% owned project located, as I said, near Ravensthorpe on the south coast. And our ultimate goal is to uh, build, build out battery anode facilities in Collie. So let's get into the Springdale Graphite Project. We released a what we called an integrated mine to market scoping study uh, in January of this year, predicated around the, the operations at Springdale. We're located just, uh, just south of the Ravensthorpe nickel mine and the Mount Catlin lithium mine. We coexist down there with agriculture and, and tourism very well. We've got enormous uh, support from the Shire Council and the local communities. And so for us, it's a wonderful place to do business. Part of the reason is because of that, the, the topography and just the landscape. Um, on the left-hand side is essentially the main deposit. Uh, the, we have sealed roads to, to the mine site. It's all on cleared farmland. And so the permitting process is going to be considerably easier um, than what might otherwise be in, um, in, other, in other parts of Western Australia. Uh, we released last year our mineral resource uh, statement for Springdale. We have uh, 49.3 million tonnes at 6.5% total graffiti content for 3.2 million tonnes of contained graphite. That puts that deposit in probably the top 15 uh, deposits of, of the Western world, um, certainly. Uh, the, perhaps the more important part of the category resource statement there is the cutoff, uh, the, the resources at the 5% cutoff grade, which is 28 million tonnes at 8.7 uh, total graffiti content for 2.4 million tonnes of material. Now, our plan is to produce 40,000 tonnes of graphite concentrate. So I'm not suggesting that 2.4 million tonnes, every one of those tonnes is uh, necessarily recoverable. But what I am saying is that there's probably 40 to 50 years of mining sitting inside that resource at this point in time. The figure on the right hand side of the, of the slide there is an aeromagnetic survey that was run over the property back in 2017. Uh, we inherited that data when we acquired the project back in um, two years ago. We've so far drilled out um, more of those anomalies that you can see shaded in, in white um, underneath the yellow oak. The yellow oak is, is where the mineral resources come from. We've explored somewhere around a quarter of the, of the tenement um, uh, profile that we have, and you can see all those areas to the north. We think there's probably at least a further resources um, perhaps doubling what's currently there uh, and being defined. So to the extent that even more mine life's required, we think we've got plenty of uh, exploration potential on the tenements. The scoping study itself, uh, we released some key statistics. I won't go them into, there's not, um, I won't go into particular detail with them. Strip ratio of 4.3, open pit, the mineralization is from surface. So we're into ore immediately. It's all oxide and um, weathered rock primarily. And so therefore the mining costs and so forth associated with this operation will be on a relative basis um, cheap. In terms of the scoping study, we only put out the first 15 years of, of, of operations where um, we were able to draw the majority of our mill feed from the indicated resource. The right hand image just shows you uh, that orange line there shows how we draw down on the indicated resource. So 72% of the first 15 years of operations came out of the indicated resource category. Uh, the next round of drilling at Springdale will, will look to reclassify inferred drilling um, up into the indicated category and extend that mine life for the purpose of putting out better uh, longer term economic projections. Simple process flow sheet, nothing exotic about the concentrator that we build. Half a million tonne per annum processing capacity um, goes through various stages of classification um, and cleaning and ultimately will uh, produce a concentrate for dispatch up to Collie. The production profile of the first 15 years is averaging just over 40,000 tonnes of concentrate per annum. 
what makes the, this opportunity really interesting for the graphite space is that we're averaging somewhere around 9.5 to 10% head grade uh, per annum for, for what's um, head grade for the, for the ore going through the mill. So what does that mean? It gives us a really, really um, competitive edge when it comes to the cost structure of the project. For a 500,000 tonne per annum plant, we can build that for $75.7 .7 million. That includes a $15.1 million contingency and nearly $10 million of pre-strip within that, within that $75.7 .7 million. So that really does, I think, represent a unique competitive advantage for us on a funding, on a funding program. And the right-hand side is where we expect our operating cost structure to fall. We'll be in the bottom third and perhaps pushing to the bottom quartile of operating costs um, of graphite concentrate producers globally. Some of that unique advantage of, uh, some of the reasons for that is the unique advantage of the, of the Springdale deposit. Close to, close to uh, infrastructure, uh, no new roads are required. We can drive up to site and get straight onto the property. Accommodation is not required. Um, because it's available regionally within the, within the townships and there's a airstrip to um, the Ravensthorpe Airport takes 600-seater um, aircraft into, into Ravensthorpe uh, on a weekly basis. Ultimately then we'll take that Springdale concentrate and move it up to, uh, truck it up to Collie where we'll be looking to build our battery anode facilities. So a bit of 101 on downstream processing. We take the graphite concentrate from Springdale it goes through a micronising process. The purpose of the micronising process is to reduce the flake size down from anywhere uh, up to 150 micron. In our case, at Springdale, down to the 5 to 25, sorry, the 15 to 22 micron size for the purpose of battery anode material. The second phase is ferritizing that, that uh, graphite. What that does is shape the, the graphite, um, micronised graphite, allow it to um, be better handled through the purification and coating process. Importantly, when you spheroidise, you'll lose some material, what they call the yield, um, in the industry, and you'll have a micronised byproduct uh, to, to account for in your product suite. After spheroidising, we purify the product. We take it from 95% graphite concentrate at Springdale to 99.95% battery grade. And at that point, you have a saleable intermediate product and it's something that, um, that Benchmark actually quote on. The final step is to coating, and that's where we get into the battery anode material. If you go to Collie today, you'll see a pilot plant micronising and spheroidising um, equipment, and we've uh, done a number of uh, micronising and spheroidising test work programs through that to demonstrate that we can uh, come up with a mar marketable product. We've purified our concentrate over in um, Germany and just recently came out with a really outstanding um, set of uh, electro winning, uh, electrochemical, beg your pardon, test work. Um, Results. This is a snapshot of the, the outcomes of the Colley um, integrated study. Um, I won't go into the detail, but for significant cash flows being generated there for the intermediate product and also the final coated product. Build up of the capital cost estimate, um, again, which comes straight from the feasibility study. Finally, uh, what we're doing at Colley now is building out our micronising capability. You'll see there in the foreground is our qualification, micronising qualification plant. We're going to expand that to 4,000 tonnes per annum over the next six to 12 months. We've been ably assisted in this process by um, state and federal governments, uh, whom we are very thankful for their, for their ongoing support. And we think there'll be more support to come and some excellent opportunities for shareholders to um, benefit from that support. So finalised, um, micronised graphite producer in Collie from 2025 multi-decade graphite mine down at Springdale, um, entering that battery anode market over time um, with excellent support from community and local government. Thanks all for listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. It's a great little project, isn't it? And the support from the government is so impressive that we have in the West at the moment. Our last presenter today, I could tell you so much about this gentleman. I've actually had the great pleasure of knowing him for more than 20 odd years. So, and what I can tell you about him is that he's always, when he says he's gonna do something, he follows through it. He's one of those tenacious human beings. He's got a really good reputation in the industry. He's worked with BHP Billiton, Western Mining Corporation, several of the junior corporations as well. He's held senior roles with BHP. Who else have you been with? Um, Leinster, Mount Keith, 
W.A. Nickel Brown. It's a really, really long list, and everywhere he's gone, he's done something really amazing. So on this occasion, he's, as he stands before you today, he is the MD of the Duke, Duketon Mining Limited. So let's hear what the potential is in this new project that he has to share with us. Welcome, Stuart Fogarty. Thanks, Chrissy. And uh, <clears throat> thanks, everybody, for turning up the last session of the day. Um, we'll try and make it a little bit punchy and a little bit purposeful and uh, get on with it. Um, look, I'm here to talk about Dukedon. Dukedon's an interesting story. We've been around for about 10 years. Um, we've, you know, and everybody talks about structure and, and um, the quality of the company, but at the end of the day, we've raised money once out of, in that 10 years. Um, we have a healthy cash balance in the, in the bank right now. We've got a good nickel project. It's not a great time to be a nickel, but it's a good project and we're advancing that, and we've got a very good tale of exploration projects behind that that are looking at all the future-facing commodities as this, uh, this conference is all about. Look, there's a disclaimer there. You can talk, you can look at that online. You obviously can't read that, but we need to put it up. This is the company, okay, and we're in very good shape. We're, in a, we're a West Australian-focused exploration company. Um, we have 122 million shares on issue. Um, we have 11, just over $11 million in the bank. We've got a couple of million dollars of investments in there as well. We've got a very good structure around the shareholder base. We've got a guy called Kerry Hermanis, who's a nickel bull at the end of the day, um, holds a fair component of the company. We've got a small institution on the register and then, quite importantly, directors and management hold about 11% of the company as well. <coughs> Look, we are focused on the nickel project. Um, it's important to us, we, we've got our foot on it, we own it 100%, it's unencumbered and it, it's part of the story going forward. The other important part is, and, and the last point on this slide, is that we have a lot of embedded optionality in the company through exploration on other projects and we've spent some time over the last few years collecting additional projects within WA and we're now starting to pull those through to grant. They're becoming an important part of the portfolio and I'll take you through those in the latter part of this presentation. Our nickel projects sitting up through here, there's two resources, Rosie and C2, and I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. 130 kilometres line of sight back towards Leinster and Mount Keith, which is BHP Billiton's nickel sulphide base in Western Australia, and that's one of the most prolific nickel belts in the world. Uh, and we sit on the next belt across from that. And um, within the Dukedon area, there's a number of other holders there, but collectively there's about 400,000 tonnes of nickel metal in the ground, uh, and we control a portion of that um, within there. Um, the concentrators, oh, sorry. The concentrators in the area are outlined here with the green dots, um, and uh, we're not far away, and there's a little bit of infrastructure with respect to roads, etc., throughout that whole area. Uh, as I said, two large nickel deposits. 100,000 nickel tonnes in total combined in, in those jort compliant resources, just a bit over 14,000 nickel tonnes. And, and importantly, and a real differentiator compared to most other nickel deposits in WA, we've got about a quarter of a million ounces of PGEs, predominantly in the rosy deposit. Uh, we, we believe we've shown and proven that we can um, recover that through metallurgical testing that we've done. We've got a scoping study that only focuses on one of those deposits, rosy. That's positive. It was done at $8 a pound, which is just slightly higher than what the current prevailing nickel price is, so it's still looking in good order. Uh, we've pressure tested that more recently over the last six months, and that's still, the assumptions within that still, uh, still hold, hold sure. Uh, this is the results of that, pot, that uh, scoping study. It it's really points to an eight-year mine life. It's a, it's a, it's a mining and toll treating um, study. So it's not talking about building a uh, plant on site, but it's just trucking to one of those nearby concentrators. We, we ranged it between $7.50 and $8.50 nickel price. Um, you can see the MPV, and ultimately the takeaway from this is that it's highly leveraged to that nickel price, and every 50 cent movement in the nickel price as it goes up is worth about 50 to $100 million of free cash flow to this project, so it is highly leveraged to that, um, and it's very, uh, has a very low capital intensity as well. So you can read up there, it's $18 million to get into this project and that's simply a, um, it's a portal and the first part of a decline to get down to the first 
first bit of all. That's a very simple project. And ultimately, we can produce around about 300,000 tonnes at about 2% nickel equivalent out of this project on an annualised basis without even considering the other, um, other deposit we've got close by. This is what it uh, looks like in 3D. I'll just run this short video so you can get an idea. The red dots up there are all the nickel intercepts. The drill holes are the black traces. That's the 1% nickel outline for Rosie. I'll give you a sense of how large this deposit is as it rolls around. Uh, it's all, just a little bit over a kilometre long, 700 metres depth that we've drilled it to. This is the mining study that we've done. So we've, we've uh, done all of the decline, the stopes, everything else. These orange panels are the EM targets, so the uh, proxy for the exploration upside in Rosie. We think this will continue as we continue to drill it um, without any hesitation at all. Uh, and you can see C2 as we'll just focus on off to the north here. It's a slightly different beast. It's a large, um, low-grade, open pitable resource, still 900 metres in strike, open, open in all directions. Uh, we've got an optimised open pit over the top of that, and I think combined those two, both an underground and an open pit, make up an operation that makes sense to us. Just, just a quick look at the geology. This is a couple of drill holes through the middle of Rosie. Uh, it's a very standard uh, pyrotite, pyrite, chalcopyrite rich nickel sulphide deposit like any, many of the ones in Western Australia. The defining feature, however, is that large budget of PGE elements within that. Uh, and you can see some of those numbers through there. It's, it's wherever we drill it, it's multiple grams per tonne of, of PGEs within this. Both those deposits got positive metallurgical results and look, at the end of the day, they both produce what we call a saleable contract, uh, concentrate. Um, it's a pretty simple flow sheet on both of them. We've done a little bit of extra work on those, but we believe there's a lot of scope to actually refine them and tighten them up as well. Uh, we've done a little bit of work in the nickel sulphate and towards producing an uh, uh, MHP product out of, out of both of those. So just to take you through this, that's the concentrate dried out um, from, from C2 in this particular instance. This is the, the, the pressure vessel that you put it in. You put concentrate in, you put some water in with it, you bring the temperature and the pressure up slightly. It's, it's, it's not very high pressure. Uh, and ultimately that forces the nickel, copper and cobalt into solution and into what's, what's called nickel sulphate, which is that green liquid through here that you can see in these vessels. Uh, that was run over a two and a half hour period, but most of the nickel and associated metals went into solution within the first half an hour. Um, the PGEs in ROSI, um, and, and the reason we're looking at this is whether we can strip out the PGEs separately, and they will either, and we've got a little bit of flexibility in this, we can actually put it into the nickel sulphite and put, put them into solution, or we can actually hold them back and put, leave them in the residue, which is that brown material at the end. So that's the end product of all of this. Uh, and we can hold the PGEs back in there and then do a simple processing method from there as well. So we've got flexibility within this and ultimately we're talking about getting into the, uh, the precursor of the battery, battery options. Just turning our attention a little bit to other projects around the place that we've, we've hold and pro all of these are in Western Australia and all of these are future facing metals for, uh, to bulk them all together but there's a whole bunch of lithium, gold, rare earths, base metals within that portfolio. And I'll just take you through them pretty quickly uh, on an individual basis. But um, Bali, which is basically 200 kilometres north of Southern Cross in Western Australia, it's in one of the greenstone belts. 100 kilometres south of Southern Cross in the same greenstone belt is the Mount Holland lithium deposit. Uh, we see a trend all the way up the edge of this belt um, which is highlighting a lithium trend. There's lithium uh, indicators all the way through that. And more recently in the last few days, Venus Metals, which holds a tenement just off the top of this page here, have been uh, delivering some results which are multiple tens of metres at plus 1% lithium uh, in pegmatites. And we think that's probably indicative of what that whole um, trend can hold. We were actually looking at high-grade gold deposits, which are analogue for Penny, the Penny West deposit. Um, so we've got a couple of different elements that we're chasing within this particular um, tenement package. We like this, we're continuing to build it and we'll continue to work it as well. Uh, Doris, it's a historical name, but that's what it is, Doris. Uh, this is a uranium play, it's a hard rock uranium play in the northern part of the Yilgarn Crater in Western Australia. Um, it's an, it, it 
Geometry-wise, it's analogous to a, a, a gold deposit. It's shear hosted, has uranium within the shears. It has some historical drill holes in it, which look pretty good to us. We've got our foot on top of this. We're just being a little bit cautious with it. We're waiting for the legislation to be um, changed within WA to allow a little bit more positive uh, uranium mining before we do very much with this, but we kind of like it from a prospectivity and an exploration upside perspective. Stevens is a base metals play that we've got up in the Gulliwood Greenstone Belt. The deflector gold deposit, which uh, Silver Lake uh, are mining at the moment, is uh, just to the north of this. Uh, this has got a VMS signature all over it, in our opinion. There's a lot of work still to be done. We'd like to build this tenement position around this particular um, occurrence as we have it, and we think there's more to be won out of this uh, particular position. Otways is one of my favourites. It's actually still under application at the moment. We expect it to get granted in the next, uh, next month or so, essentially, and then we'll get on the ground in earnest. But some of the historical numbers on this and the reason I like it, it's a copper play. Um, back in the 60s, there was numbers like 64 at 0.7%, 64 metres at 0.7% copper, 48 metres at 0.62, um, close to surface, all hosted in fresh rock. And more recently in 2020, there's a historical hole that had a 43 metres at 0.7% copper as well in, in, in the same general area. So it gives you a sense of scale, um, fresh rock components of copper occurrences within this project. And throughout this entire tenement, we're getting rock chips of high-grade gold and high-grade copper all over this. So actually, it is a very, very interesting um, play. And it's got a little bit of lithium potential as well, which I won't talk about just now. But we'll get to that. Well, Gulen, which is the last project that I'll look at, uh, talk to, this is in the, the wheat belt. It's basically halfway between Perth and Southern Cross. Um, the, low, the closest mine is the Edna May mine, which Romelius Resources are mining, which is a gold mine, which is off to the, uh, down just off this plan here, but that drilling is, is relating to the regional work at Edna May. There's a, there's a number of anomalies up through here, and this is a, we, we put this in the, the bucket of a base metals play at this point in time. There's significant historical intercepts on this tenement, and these are all close to surface. So I'll read a couple off. 96 metres at three grams per tonne silver and almost half a, half a percent zinc. 93 metres at four grams silver, a little bit, of, little bit of lead and indications of zinc, and another 30 metre intercept of 1.6 grams per tonne silver. Uh, looks pretty interesting. We get excited about this. I think once it comes through as a granted position, we'll get on the ground and get going with this. In summary, uh, we think Jukedon's in really good shape. We've got lots of money in the vehicle. We've got a very tight share structure. We're highly leveraged to any outcome, whether it's in the nickel space, exploration space, or anything else that we do. Um, we've got a really, you know, a quite, quite a small market cap, relatively speaking, uh, and we can really take off if we get a little bit of success. Thanks very much for everyone. That's the end of the talk. Well done. Thank you very much. Your first, um, well first time up in Singapore for one of these conferences? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah it has. Yep. What's the atmosphere been like outside? It's been good. Considering, I think the market, if you consider that, this has been quite upbeat, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it's a tough, tough time. Mm -hmm. But Just slightly for nickel, but you're punching. Yeah. There's got to be green sheets, so the green sheet yeah, is and, you. And, and the one thing I'd so probably add to that is the presentations are really quite a high quality and there's some really good stories around. That's good feedback. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> good yeah. Well, you can catch up with Stuart and have a drink with him and have a chat more in depth about that project because it is an interesting one and he's certainly got some great principles behind him. Right, we see the chairs coming up on stage, which means it's time for one of our chats. So we've got an impressive lineup. We're talking decarbonisation next on the stage. Of course, it's an ongoing theme throughout uh, the event this year. So headline, decarbonisation technology, a time for industrial innovation. And we're led by Tribeca Asia Infrastructure Fund's Susanta Mazumba. Now, if I had my TV show here, we're doing an innovation show, as I said to you, down in, in Australia, We've just started filming it for the Nine Network. I would love to have them here to listen to this. In fact, there's a number of our, our people who have been on stage over the last few days I would love to get and capture and put on camera because there are some great ideas pushing us towards a better future. Hello, sir. Fantastic to see you again. I'm going to let you... Don't throw those very expensive microphones around. So <laughs> we like to recycle because that also stops out with our, our footprint there. 
So Susanna, I'll let you introduce the panel and we've got until six o'clock and I'm really looking forward to it. If you have any questions, I will be walking around with a microphone. So if we finish in time, I'll open it up to the floor. Thanks, team. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, this is the last agenda for the day. So really special thanks to all your time and attention. Uh, decarbonization is probably the most challenging human endeavor since the discovery of fossil fuel hydrocarbon almost 150 years back. Uh, but at the same time, decarbonization is probably the most important step to uh, you know, clean our environment, and this is very important part. And energy transition and decarbonization both actually go hands in hand. Generally, their mining industry contributes four to seven percent of the carbon emission, which on a relative basis, probably not as large as transportation or the powered industry, but still on a standalone basis, this is a pretty significant. And there are aspects like economic aspects, political aspects, and the technological aspects of decarbonization. Here we are focusing on the technology aspects, and we have got a very distinguished speakers with a deep hands-on knowledge of the industry. Let me introduce to Ms. Shibom Palikia. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. She's the manager for ESG Australasia at RPM Global. Uh, she has been in the mining industry for 18 years and focused on technology, ESG consulting, planning, and assessment. Then you have got Mr. Cameron Sharp, mining account manager for Caterpillar Australia. At Caterpillar, he was involved in decarbonization initiatives, hybrid power solutions, and electric fluids related infrastructure. We have got Mr. Hendy Sanderson. He actually made a presentation on uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, he's the author of Voltras, Winner and Losers, Race to Green, which was voted one of the best science and environmental books of 2022 by the Times. Thank you. Probably I will uh, start with Ms. Shibam to ask you the first question. How are the things are changing in the mining industry and the companies to decarbonize all the way to the project planning stage? Uh, so I, I will just start by saying that I feel like quite a rare species amongst this crowd, um, being neither a geologist or an engineer, but rather an environmental scientist. And, and even worse, a consultant. So I have been flying the green flag of sustainability in the mining industry for, for a long time. Um, and I suppose it's really been a pleasure to watch this profound shift in how ESG and, and in particular decarbonisation criteria has been incorporated at a very early stage of project planning. Um, in the last four years, I would say the biggest shift I've seen is companies uptaking uh, decarbonisation criteria and inputting it into their scoping studies and pre-feasibility studies uh, in a way that's really materially impacting on project descriptions um, and, and the project design. So whether it's looking at the different options available um, through the processing phase or um, fleet movements, and, and, I'll, and I'll leave fleet electrification to Cameron because it's, it's his area of expertise, um, we're really seeing a much more granular approach um, in, in every component of decarbonisation um, that, that does occur through, through a mining operation all the way from construction through to closure. Um, the, the, other, the other aspect that I really see emerging, um, and, and I think we've seen some good examples of it, is decarbonisation as a concept really influencing a company's decision on where they invest the deposit they invest in um, and the technology they're applying. And, and probably one of the best examples, and we've heard about it this week, is the emergence of deep um, geothermal uh, brine, lithium brine deposits um, in Europe and North America. And the application of um, direct lithium extraction technology um, and, and that drive towards putting decarbonisation um, at the forefront of that decision making at the very, um, you know, conceptual stage of deciding where, where to put your investment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharp, uh, Caterpillar has many large pull up customers offering very innovative solutions. You are on the forefront of that. Within decarbonation technology, what, do you, what makes you most excited about that? 
Uh, well, I'm fortunate to, to work with Caterpillar and involved in some of these new technologies which are being deployed, uh, allowing our key clients to meet a lot of their, uh, their goals that have been set. Uh, with an engineering background, it's nice to be part of these uh, new technologies. There's a lot of problems that you encounter, so finding solutions to said problems, uh, you know, is quite, uh, it is great from my perspective. I got involved in hybrid power systems in 2014, and at that stage, there was no hybrid power systems in mining in Australia. Uh, I was presenting to mining companies and independent power producers, and often just about getting laughed out of the room as some kind of tree-hugging hippie. You know, and now 10 years on, we, we don't see many power systems getting built that aren't hybrid in one way, shape or form, adopting renewables, energy storage and reducing the run hours of the gensets and of course the, the fossil fuel used. Uh, now I'm a modest man, so I'm not going to claim all responsibility for all the, the change in, in the uptake of hybrid power systems, but now I'm involved in these battery electric trucks, it's, it's just nice to play a part in the uh, in the rollout of these new technologies, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's good to see uh, the momentum that can be gathered by some of these new tech. It's it involves a transformational change in mining. You know, it, it's it's easy enough to plan for these electric vehicles and all the reticulation of electric power and the charging infrastructure for a greenfields mine, but it's it's often difficult when you're looking at uh, adopting these technologies in an existing mine. Uh, from an electric power perspective, of course, it requires the adoption of, you know, considerably more power uh, to be able to keep these uh, vehicles operational and, and the running of power to, uh, you know, the bottom of, of uh, surface mining pits and, uh, and underground mines is problematic. It's difficult to make some of these uh, requirements fit with uh, existing legislation, mining rules, uh, and, and, you know, the, the country in question is electrical safety rules. So it involves quite a lot of uh, augmentation of existing rules to be able to adopt some of these two technologies. It's, it's often like trying to put a round peg in a square hole quite often. I completely agree. I think mining equipment, trucks, etc., are probably the most difficult to electrify, unlike like cars and small stuff. So we have actually more questions for you later on. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanderson, you had a great, fascinating presentation yesterday morning. Uh, maybe you can share some of your thoughts and some of key insights from your book, Voltras, for the for us, for all of us. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, you know what I wrote a lot about in my book is the sort of existing supply chain for for battery minerals, and a lot of that goes through China, um, which relies on, on, on coal-fired power. And I think what we're seeing now um, is this, this desire to have a manufacturing renaissance in the West is accompanied with a, a desire to clean up some of these processes. And I think um, one of the advantages of, I guess, starting with a blank slate um, is are there ways we can uh, compete with China by innovations that, that help to lower the cost and improve the sustainability of uh, processing and, and manufacturing uh, batteries. Um, so, so I covered a bit of it in the book, but I think that's, that's really key now um, going forward. We've had a lot of innovation on uh, battery chemistries, on, on cathode chemistries, but now I think innovation on, on the manufacturing side um, and on the processing side. And if we, if we start out building processing in the West, are there steps um, that we can cut out um, you know, through innovation that can reduce the carbon footprint and reduce the capex, and that can help us, um, you know, have a cost advantage potentially um, over the Chinese um, systems, and and that's all about also about decarbonizing all of the materials, you know, steel and uh, aluminium, uh, copper, etc. And I think we're seeing, um, you know, this week the U.S. government committed six billion for um, industrial decarbonization technologies. So we're seeing that, that push um, very much going on. So that's how I see, um, see things going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Probably I'll have a second question with uh, you, Ms. Siobhan, is uh, what are the key challenges for the mining industry to decarbonize? Uh, and again, it's an open-ended question, but please feel free. Well, where do we start? Um, I think you know, I, I mean, I come from Western Australia, so I'll, I'll put my Western Australian cap on for this one. 
and I think the first one is remoteness. So we, we tend to love going exploring for um, commodities in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, that's that's where they are. And you know, I don't know if anyone from Chalice is in the room, but good on you for finding one just down the road, um, out of a out of a fairly established city. Um, so the remoteness means that historically and, and even currently diesel uh, power supply um, or gas, if it was available, was really the, the most practical and, and economic option. Um, you know, if we're really going to move away from fossil fuel use, uh, we have to start considering uh, these off grid uh, systems. Um, and, and really for your typical junior miner who's trying to uh, get a project up and running, um, you know, it's cost prohibitive and, and unreliable. Um, so I would say that's probably one of the initial um, challenges that, that certainly we face in, in the WA environment. Um, the second one I would probably say is capacity. So if you take a region like the Pilbara, um, where in the next 10 years you are going to have so many mines coming um, online, um, and that if, you, if you're gonna tap into the existing power grid, um, then the pressure on those suppliers, those existing suppliers to actually provide a green source of, of electricity um, is gonna require just the most rapid and advanced um, development of renewable systems. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I am a quasi greenie, but I, I do think that there's a, there's a place for the debate around nuclear power uh, due to remoteness and capacity. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharp, again, going back to her point that your electrification of mining machinery, trucks, et cetera, is going to be one of the key important point to address the mining industry challenge for carbon emissions. And you have been pioneered with that and you are working with the big companies which call like early learner clients. Could you share about your experience and how that initiative is going on? Uh, well, in relation to uh, to trying to get some of these new technology to fit with existing rules, it's it's tough. Uh, you know, a, a solar farm or a battery system operating in a utility type application is entirely different to operating on a a mine site. Uh, you know, you look at uh, live work, uh, which is inherent with working on battery systems, uh, arc flash, uh, segregation of componentry. You know, when you look at a PV inverter or a battery inverter, generally they've got lots of different equipment inside a box uh, with lots of different voltages and relays and breakers. This doesn't fit the bill on, on mine sites. You know, it all needs to be segregated into form three and four boards for, for certain mining clients. So trying to get these technologies to fit with existing rules is tough. And, and then when you start looking at the electrification of vehicles, which is still in its infancy, you know, we're just at the trial stage at present. And, and as you mentioned, we will be deploying vehicles with, with some of our larger clients, uh, the early learners, which is all publicly available information. There's, there's BHP, Rio Tinto, Newmont, Tech Resources, Freeport McMorrin, and uh, Nova Mondi Graphite. So these are clients that we're gonna be deploying battery electric vehicles with, and it's initially one vehicle for trials, and you know they're gonna be going into cold climates, hot climates, wet climates, soft underfoot. And these vehicles are gonna be uh, you know, charging while they're moving. So they're gonna be you know, much like a tram or an electric train, uh, they'll be charging for periods of the incline from the bottom of the pit and then producing regenerative loads when they're traveling uh, back down to the bottom of the pit uh, through the braking of the electric wheel motors. Uh, so yeah, lots of interesting technologies. You know, you really need to think about the land required uh, for all the deployment of green energy as well, which is why I mentioned it's probably easier to be looking at it in the planning stages. Uh, you know, you also look at some of these new technologies and there's not as much brand recognition as there probably is in some existing tech. So you see kind of lower quality products sometimes getting put into these applications and they probably won't stand the test of time. Uh, but uh, it's a learning curve and, uh, yeah. you know, it's all, uh, it's all in its infancy at this point. That's but sure. uh, it's just interesting to see the momentum of these technologies when they do catch hold. Yeah. Sure. No, I agree. You are, and you have been the pioneer in this industry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sanderson, changing the track a little bit, uh, we talk a lot on the supply side, but a little bit on the demand side. 
and yesterday morning in your presentation, you showed like a different set of cars. So SUV, big car, need big batteries, and which always have their challenges. Whereas if you go for a smaller car, the adoption of battery EV can be much faster. Could you talk about a little bit more on the demand side management and how that can go along with the supply side and can have faster decarbonization of our society? Yes, so um, you know, that's one of the big questions of, uh, if you think about China, they've, they've already um, you know, conquered the mass market cheap EV, um, costing $11,000 or so. Um, I think the big challenge now for, for the West um, is getting to that mass market stage um, and getting consumers to accept smaller cars, um, smaller batteries, because this will have a huge impact on raw material uh, demand. So that's also about building the infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure um, to, to accommodate, to make people feel that range anxiety um, is, is not a big issue. And then also that unlocks new technologies such as um, sodium iron, you know, that potentially could be more uh, sustainable in, t in terms of raw materials. Um, so in a sodium iron battery, you know, you can often just have iron, uh, manganese, materials like this. Um, you can use aluminium at both, both, uh, both ends, so you, you don't need the copper. So, uh, you know, that kind of application could be opened by, um, by having smaller batteries and markets like India, obviously, um, could, could, be, could, could, could be a big one. Um, for that, yeah, so I think that's, um, that's really an open question. We'll have huge impact on um, uh, raw material demand and, and also getting consumers um, aware of how they can use their batteries in their cars, such as, um, you know, giving power back to the grid and actually receiving some compensation for that as well, which will, which will further incentivize um, that shift. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, going back to Shivan, uh, could you talk about little bit of what kind of role the regulators and the government is playing and uh, what kind of pressure they are putting directly and directly on the many of the industry players to accelerate decarbonization process. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the pressure is coming from really all over the place and whether it be uh, legislation, um, stakeholder expectations, uh, lender expectations, um, we're, we're just seeing a, a profound shift in terms of um, what's driving um, some of the changes in terms of decarbonisation. So probably um, I would start with legislation. So there's been rollout of legislation in, in most um, developed countries around um, commitments towards net zero um, and, and typically, but not always aligned with Paris Agreement. Um, so that there's a sort of foundation um, and, and then you move to more sort of uh, specific requirements where you're seeing certain jurisdictions require um, companies to demonstrate their, their milestone reductions in CO2 emissions um, with, with a straight line trajectory to net zero by 2050, but also requiring that to be implemented by 2030. And, and you know, the challenge there being that until we actually do see the rollout of, of commercial um, viable options of electrification in fleets or, or alternative uh, fuel fleets and, and similarly um, reliable renewable uh, um, power supply, um, you know, actually demonstrating those milestone reductions is going to be a challenge. Um, at, at probably at a, a market exchange level, um, you know, we're seeing the requirement for CO2 disclosures. Um, so, so Singapore Stock Exchange um, already requires companies to disclose their uh, CO2 emissions. Well, not all companies, but certainly, and it's, it will expand to all companies. Um, Europe and the UK as well, and, and you know, Australia also, um, you know, this year will require that disclosure. And, and those disclosures will, will be treated very much like financials in terms of the assurance level required. So um, when you consider that it is actually going to be out there in the public domain, it will be scrutinised, you're absolutely going to be compared to your peers. Um, you know, when, when there are limited funds that everyone's after to support their their operations, um, it, it starts to really dr sure. drive that decision making process. Sure. But at the same time, I think you made a very good point that you need the policy support, you need the technology, and you need a bit of innovation and demand side, and all three need to work together to decarbonize. Yeah. Um, I think, Mr. Sharp, you talk about some of the 
issues and challenges. Maybe we can dwell upon a little bit on uh, some of the hybrid solutions you are working on. Uh, and again, we know that mining industry is one of the toughest to decarbonize. So maybe you can talk about a little bit of the challenges you are facing. Uh, yeah, a lot of the challenges come around the, uh, the electrical safety rules. I mean, of course, safety is paramount. But trying to fit some of these new technologies into the existing rules is extremely hard. Uh, it'll also require a real change in skill sets in the mining industry. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, automotive electricians, but uh, that's not what's required for these new technologies. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can see uh, improvements in, in technology and, and batteries and the likes, but, uh, you know, when you start looking at the reticulation of power, uh, for these mine sites, it's uh, it's challenging. Uh, you require we're we're doing modelling for clients at the moment, and you know in some sites you need to you know double your your power generation. Most likely, that's going to have to be through green energy. Uh, trying to get these energy solutions to fit with existing rules is tough, and the reticulation of the power to some of these locations is uh, is extremely tough with the, the current rules and. And an augmentation of these rules will be required if these uh, technologies are going to uh, progress. <laughs> Again, you know, mining industry is like a 24 by 7. It's not like um, you were running on a battery, battery drains out in the midst of mining nowhere, and then you have got others like diesel generator comes. It's a 24 by 7 industry. So in that kind of thing, how do you make that hybrid solution successful and ensure that client has a seamless experience at the same time they make progress in the decarbonization? Yes, I mean, there's a lot of positives to looking at these new technologies. I mean, a, a battery electric vehicle can potentially be more productive than a, a diesel machine because it doesn't require to be stopped and filled with diesel periodically. It can be running all the time. Most likely it's going to be autonomous. Uh, you know, autonomy and the, and the applicable MindStar software is going to be quite critical. You know, you need to make sure that these vehicles aren't all charging up at the same time. Uh, you've, on an islanded power system, you've got a, a limited amount of electric power available at any time. And even on a grid connected site, you know, you don't want to be seeing these huge transients and spikes because that can affect your, uh, your tariff moving forward. So uh, communication is going to be critical, you know, knowing what's available from the power source and, and having the uh, uh, interoperability between all the different uh, technologies is, is also critical. So communications is going to be uh, really, uh, is going to have to advance moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanderson, uh, again, going back to uh, your yesterday presentation, you showed a chart where China captures almost 80-90% of the lithium and mm -hmm. cathode processing capacity in the world. Um, again, you are talking about some innovative solutions. So probably you can talk about a little bit more. And in addition to the lithium and cathode, what are the other areas you feel that uh, Western world can have more innovations? Yeah, so there are very um, energy intensive steps involved. And I think um, graphite and anodes is one of those areas that, was, uh, that hasn't been looked at closely enough. And again, when you localize supply chains, um, you have an opportunity to, to clean, clean them up and make them more sustainable. And if you're talking sort of making synthetic graphite at the moment in China, you know, it's sort of heated to 3000 degrees um, for 30 days in these open, open furnaces um, using coal fired electricity. So it's, it's not a good situation, right? Um, so I think there are real opportunities to decarbonize um, graphite and, and anodes. Um, and, and that's what we see happening with new innovations, new technologies. Um, but, but one issue is, yes, you can, you can do that by putting these plants in areas with, with renew, renewable energy. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is increased competition uh, for that renewable energy. Um, for instance, I was recently in Sweden, and you know, there's huge increase projected in power demand because you've got clean, uh, green steel uh, being built there. You've got Northolt, the big battery producer. Um, you've, got, you've got other companies. Um, so they all want this hydropower, but there's actually not enough. Um, to go around. Um, and the same, we're seeing industry move to Quebec and other areas where there's plentiful renewable energy, but I think the competition for that energy is going to be quite acute. And uh, there was a chart shown earlier in the conference about the uh, power demand from AI and, and data centers. So we're going to see all this um, demand coming on that has to be met with, with renewable um, supply or renewable plus nuclear and other 
um, other supply. And when we look at hydropower, we saw in China uh, a few summers ago that, uh, you know, partly because of climate change and these climate impacts, it's going to be, be also a, a less reliable uh, source of power potentially. And we've seen a lot of the industry in China shift to the southwest where there is hydropower. Um, but again, they ran into problems when there was droughts and, and lack of supply. So I think competition for power as we decarbonize these industries is, is going to be really intense. Thank you. Uh, again, just to summarize that uh, we need policy support, we need technology, and we need innovation as well as the demand management. Uh, if I have missed out any points, we probably have a couple of minutes uh, uh, before we wrap up. Any points if you, any of the speaker wants to mention? Well, I would probably, we haven't spoken about scope three emissions, which I, I think, you know, is, is sort of the thing we all avoid because we're not really sure how to deal with it. Um, and, and particularly in terms of scope three emissions, I think really one of the most critical things there is, is having sophisticated uh, databases and, and software solutions that enable you to analyze, um, you know, the carbon footprint of your supply chain. Uh, so, look, I think that there will be there will be a shift in time, um, and whether or not markets decide that we need to be reporting our scope three emissions is the next question. Um, but certainly, something that I think we do need technological advances, um, whether it be through blockchain technology um, or, or, or other um, emerging technologies in that space, uh, we're going to need that to really truly understand our scope three emissions. Yeah, I mean, from a, from a Caterpillar perspective, we're embracing a lot of these new uh, decarbonizing uh, initiatives. We've been in electric power since 1939 when we produced our first generator set, so we, we feel we're carrying a pretty good hand into this electrification phase. I mean, coming up with an electric uh, mining truck, you know, it's our battery electric 793, which will be the first we deploy. We've got some underground machines also, but... Uh, you know, coming up with that solution, yes, it's, it's great, it's fantastic, but it's only half, half of the puzzle. You know, having the uh, electrical infrastructure to be able to keep said vehicles charged and productive is, uh, again, uh, you know, a very important part. Uh, but it's exciting times, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Anything else? Any last word from your side? No, I agree on this, the scope three. I mean, <laughs> as I say, if you're a battery producer, you can move, you can use renewable energy to produce batteries, but you have to deal with the yeah. carbon footprint of your yes. supply chain and the raw materials. And we heard it um, this week from, from Nickel Industries, which it was quite interesting to see they're investing in a big uh, solar, uh, solar power plant in Indonesia. So that needs, you know, all of that needs to happen so that the final battery can, can get to a, a lower carbon footprint, including, including the supply chain. I think that makes the point that uh, energy transition and decarbonization, they go hand in hand. You need the renewable power. At the same time, you need the decarbonization. And it's a long journey. It's, we don't believe it's a 10 years process. Probably it needs a much longer than that. Um, and, but it's important that we make the first step. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you, audience, again, is the last agenda. So far, thank you for your time and as well as attention. Really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Do you reckon we could get a really nice photo of these guys together? Would that be possible from our videographer down the front there? I'd love to get a photo of these guys up on the stage with that in front of it. I think um, that would be really great for Tribeca as well. So if I can ask you to stay there for a moment, I should probably release them, shouldn't I? Would that be a good idea? <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much, everyone, for staying until the end today and, and taking the time to hear this really important conversation. We're going to let you go out there now into the foyer. We've got drinks for you. We've got some food. You're welcome to stay for a little while and enjoy one another's company and network. And just keep an eye on your program. There's a full list again there of what's happening tomorrow. We'd love to see you back. So enjoy and be safe on your way home too. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>